Hello viewers, welcome once again to your very own Staff Ka Podcast. Today we have with us Brigadier Sanjay Thakur, Yuddha Seva Medal, Sena Medal and Mention and Dispatches, who has served in the Indian Army for close to 33 years and is one of the legends of 9 Para SF. In today's episode, we'll talk about his early life, his days as an athlete playing hockey, his academy days, his tenure in Siachen with 5 Bihar and his tenures in Sri Lanka and Kashmir with 9 Para SF. We'll also talk about his days as the commanding officer of the 9 Para SF. In today's episode, he'll shed some light on his post-army life and his new venture. We hope you enjoy the episode. Jai. Thank you so much, sir. And welcome to Staff Ka Podcast. Aapka baut baut swagat hai. Sir, start karna chahenge uh, to understand your early life. Thoda childhood ke baare mein agar aap bataayin to. Okay. My father was in the Air Force. So generally we have been going all around the country, uh, wherever he was posted. And uh, that was a big challenge. Uh, you know, I, I really pity and my sympathies are with the children, you know, of, uh, of parents who keep moving every two years. Uh, you have to make new friends. Uh, the teachers, they have to accept you. The principal, you know, every time you feel he's a big demon and you know, devil over there. And uh, then again, uh, by the time you get friendly with everybody, you again move. It's a big challenge and uh, easier to stay in one school and, you know, grow in confidence. But uh, I feel it is both ways uh, as we have seen so many schools in our, uh, you know, uh, school life. Uh, we we got confident as the years went by. And uh, after some time, we felt that we need to change the school because three years uh, we've been and uh, we need more friends and things like that. So it cuts both ways, of course. Yes, sir. And I was an outdoor uh, boy, uh, generally, yeah. you know, uh, not an indoor. I always was outdoor, uh, chasing the butterflies, chasing, you know, birds, uh, chasing, you know, uh, those eagles, uh, their shadows, you know, and running here, running there, climbing trees, uh, playing uh, cricket, football, hockey, whatever I could lay my hands on. It was very difficult for a child like me to uh, stay quiet and patiently and listen to the teacher. So mostly I was punished, you know, I was standing on a desk on, outside the class, you know, anything and everything. That's how my early, uh, I feel up to about six standard, I was like this. <laughs> right. Yes. Sir. So, sir, you mentioned in one of your podcasts that you were a hockey player also uh, before yeah. joining the army. Yeah. yeah so how yeah. did that come about, sir? <laughs> yeah. Aditya, you know, uh, sports uh, for children is really good. I, I can say in retrospect, uh, because uh, from, uh, you know, early on, uh, fourth, fifth standard, I started playing all types of games, actually much before also. But I caught on to hockey around fifth standard. And uh, my, my my father had presented me, you know, a hockey stick and new balls. And, and he said, uh, and he also used to play. So uh, then after playing for uh, one or two years, I felt that a lot of skill is required. So I used to practice for hours together. And uh, by the time I reached seven standard, I, I, I was good. And then, uh, you know, my dreams started, you know, forming. I said, uh, you know, I started watching, you know, these matches and things like that. And uh, so gradually, you know, that I st started playing in local tournaments and things like that. By 8th, ninth standard, uh, uh, playing, you know, about uh, one, two hours in the morning, one, two hours in the evening, uh, you really fell in love with the game and, you know, uh, so, and st stuck on to one game only, that is just hockey, purely hockey. Then started dreaming of playing for the state and playing for, you know, your your country and uh, things like that. And um, uh, in, I, I played for All India, you know, Kendra Vidyalaya, which goes to... Uh, school Games Federation of India, SGFI, for schools. And uh, then subsequently, of course, I played for, um, at that time, Madras University. Then I played for Tamil Nadu State. I played for Punjab University. My dream was to play for the country. But, but somehow, I felt that, uh, at, at one point, I felt I will not make it. Uh, I'm not that good. So when that realization set in, uh, I thought I should move. So I, I hung my hockey uh, at the age of, I think, about 21 years. I, I felt I'm not not good enough. Yeah. Okay. So, sir, there was a match where you realized that ki, uh, 
you're not yeah, up to the I, like yeah, yeah you're something. right you're right you know uh, uh, i used to play for punjab university so um, uh, so we there was a visiting uh, team i i don't recollect a european team which had come to chandigarh and uh, you know the coach had uh, put me and uh, uh, at that uh, in that tournament uh, what happened was and i i was a defender I, my eyes were very good and all that and uh, uh, he did not put me in the i- initial part of the game and i always used to be in the playing level so what happened was uh, i don't know a, a, a evening prior or two evenings prior i uh, spoke for my you know colleagues uh, he was not uh, fielding the i felt at, at a young age see the coach and manager yeah. now we realize they are very you know they are very mature people they know what they're doing but as a youngster i felt that he was not putting the players who are playing well and he was making them sit out so i spoke for them he didn't like it so what happened two days later when this exhibition match took place he didn't put me in the playing level he kept me in the reserve and uh, then under pressure from you know the public and all they started shouting why is this guy not playing so he put me in the last 10 minutes of the game a defender you cannot bring in the last 10 minutes there is no way he he will take 3 to 4 minutes 5 minutes for his eyes to set in so before my eyes could set in one goal was scored against us and at that time the the match was match was draw because of my being whatever i was put in and i you know in the 5 minutes it took me to settle down one goal was scored against us so i realized that uh, in a, you know in a team game uh, you actually uh, you may be as good as you think you are but you are a puppet in the hands of the manager the system the management and things like that if you don't carry them with you or they don't carry you with them uh, you can falter and uh, you know what has happened but others will not know and your career can be marked you know can be marred yeah. so i thought that uh, it's better to play an individual game and excel rather than in a team game where there is a little bit of politics and things like that and we are giving our whole lifetime i was playing from 6 7 standard every day for you know subsequently it came to 3 to 4 hours in the morning my father used to take me by scooter drop me in the you know stadium early morning 4:30 i used to get up and then come to school attend and again go back and play and come back in the last bus at 10 o'clock and this went on for years and all that i felt is of no use because there is a little bit of politics and it happens in every game i didn't have a mentor i didn't have a coach i was on my own in a hostel so i took a decision and in retrospect i feel that i took a correct decision i decided let me join the army <laughs> yes yes sir absolutely so army how did it come about sir did, what motivated you or uh, actually uh, you know uh, Uh, what i feel is that uh, in retrospect it's it it didn't just come like that in retrospect i feel that uh, things happen so when i was in 6 standard my father was after me to put me in military school belgaum i we were studying there he was posted there and uh, my mother said no no there is no way so that was w- one chance where i missed i was keen there was uh, i was studying in st paul's adjacent is military school belgaum so uh, i missed the chance and i told my father that i would have loved to join he said no your mother is not agreeing so just let it be so i let it go then uh, subsequently you know in 11th standard i studied for nda i wanted to join i was very keen to join nda and we were staying in all fo stations because he was an fo officer so i it was not uh, something it was it came naturally to me so i studied for nda and but because of my sports and things like that i couldn't make it so i just uh, uh, i uh, twice i made an attempt twice to pass the nda exam i i didn't make it there was no time to study i was just about scraping through in my classes also because the, almost the whole year we were playing tournaments and as one side i had a dream to play for the country other side to nda it didn't match so whatever i just about scraped through in my classes also and subsequently when i came here to punjab university i was studying in dav chandigarh and uh, there uh, when i had a tiff with the coach Uh, there i found uh, you know <laughs> even today chandigarh you know students are in large number about 40% of the population there are students and the students at uh, in chandigarh are studying for all types of competitive exams you name it 
so i you know just looked around and they all knew what was happening so they said uh, forget it yeah it's okay just too bad you know how students are very positive in their uh, framework so they told me you join this group they are studying for you know combined defense services i said yeah what which group is this they took me there were about uh, 40 students who were studying for combined defense services and uh, aditya you will really be you know shocked that you know i started studying and then one of one you know student he came to me i had helped him uh, you know all students help out each other so i had helped him somewhere so he came to me and he said you are uh, have you filled up your form i said i, I don't know i am not filled up anything he said bloody hell you are lost case you don't even fill up a form when you are studying so he said you don't worry i will fill up your form he filled up my form i just had to sign and it was already late he went and gave it at delhi just before the closing time and after that i have not yet seen him in life and uh, the call letter came and everything and with that group you know we were studying and carrying out mock uh, you know interviews and all that and i just sailed through so it, this was my third attempt uh, you can say a military school yeah. and then nda and so so it had to be i feel i had to come this side yeah it was meant to be this way you had to yeah. join the army ultimately very right here yeah, yeah i feel yeah. so 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 how, what how was your ssb experience yeah ssb uh, you know actually there was no time to prepare because uh, we were playing in uh, where were we playing we were playing in uh, chutikon i think in tamil nadu there was uh, i i had uh, after chandigarh uh, i had written the examination and then i went back to chennai from where i had come and uh, i was uh, i had joined a college over there doing my ma and uh, uh, you know and i was playing for at that time madras university in uh, inter university tournament down south when i got a call letter and i was told from there itself you go directly to allahabad where your ssb is to be there so you know uh, boarded from there and i went so there was hardly any preparation uh, this is what i want to tell you know all children you know that uh, uh with uh, with sports your confidence uh, is superb you know super super it is there is no way uh, any not even an iota of doubt comes into you uh, because you are you are winning you are losing you take everything in your stride this is one take away from any good sports you play that winning and losing comes easily to you there is there's another game there's another day so i just went and uh, there was not a book i had read there was nothing i had prepared and i asked my father before going that dad what do i do uh, how do i prepare i have not read anything he said you don't worry you just uh, face the you know question, uh, whatever the interview is and they will know whether you are right or wrong so you don't worry you just answer from whatever you feel is correct so it went through like a shot you know it it went through and they grilled you you know they grill you but they are looking not for correct answers they are trying to gauge your personality so and uh, you have passed your written examination so here they are just gauging you psychologically and psychologically uh, whoever is the you know psychological assessment officer he is studying you deeply to see if you have any negative traits and things like that and whatever so as a sportsman uh, you uh, hardly have a problem uh, in fact you take everybody you are a team player you know so i helped out everybody they helped me out in whatever way so it was uh, you know just uh, i think 3 4 days it just went by just like that yeah right sir. so uh, after your ssb got selected and landed up in ima so how was the time there sir yeah uh, ima was a indian military academy dehradun was uh, you know a, a, like a dream come true i joined in uh, january 2000 uh, 1984 and um, you know uh, it was uh, it it was really great you know to see and uh, i was in superb physical condition you know there uh, you you the cadets and all are put through all the rigors and all to make them fit i was superbly fit which everyone came to know almost immediately so they you know they tried to shield me and uh, you know try and tell me that you take it easy because there is a lot of you know this thing over here don't get injured because of your super fitness so i uh, conserved myself over there but i enjoyed it all the outdoor exercises the map reading the firing you know going uh, you know for you know various exercises outside uh, you know and climbing mountains and 
doing lot of pitu runs you know with 30 kg 40 kg 5 kg your rifle run your you know your uh, ragda over there the discipline they teach you the drill they teach you you know and they bring in a lot of virtues in you your your they they that potential is already there but they shine it and they tell you that these are the most important ingredients uh, for a soldier to be disciplined to be punctual uh, to have determination to never say die attitude so all those uh, things which will help you in a battle is what they grill it into you and uh, to speak up not to be you know to be morally also straight morally have the courage to speak up physically of course they teach you so many things to bring out the you know to keep uh, the fear aside and just do your job so it's a, it was a one and a half years of you know i really enjoyed my one and a half years at indian military academy and the speakers over there such a you know large uh, you know strength of uh, people from all over across and also foreign dignitaries used to come and give us uh, you know lectures and motivate us Uh, and uh, listening to them you know i was a person i used to make a lot of notes i make notes even today for everything for your thing also i wrote about five six pages <laughs> when you write notes and you know small tidbits here and there uh, your mind gets activated you don't get bored when you attend a lecture you know and things like that so you get into the habit uh, either you start writing in your computer laptop wherever but you keep jotting down so i enjoyed i am it was really good and it uh, and uh, sam bahadur you know I, you must have seen his movie he was yes. my idol right from the beginning so i <laughs> you have mentors you need to have mentors and idols you know uh, because you need to see as to what is good and uh, in by all those things so i i enjoyed i mean yes sir any stories that you would like to share from i mean days yeah i am a yeah, you know uh, i am a is a very strict uh, place you you can't make mistakes over there you're punished for any small thing is you're punished uh, if you go outside without you know any passes and you know they call it liberty and all i was a very a contented person i never used to go outside anyway i used to enjoy wherever i am and nothing whatever they show me i see whatever they give i eat things like that but uh, there was the inter you know uh, company hockey tournament and i i did not have a good stick so i had applied for pass but one of my friends told me hey, this is not the way i don't apply for pass and all let's just scale the wall and go i told him hey, why what is the reason there's no requirement <laughs> he said no no don't worry let's do this this way i said okay he said i have been going every second week or third week outside i said okay fine so we scaled the wall and we went to dehradun the city and i was buying my hockey stick and suddenly you know i had the huge six and a half foot guy standing in front of me and he said yeah what are you doing here <laughs> so i just smiled at him i said wow well, i have come to buy a stick what i looked and who have you come with and i looked left and right my friend was missing so i said i have come alone so he said no i don't think you come alone <laughs> where's your friend i said i don't know <laughs> so you know so then anyway we were matched up and things like that and so they gave us some little bit of punishment so uh, that was the one punishment i got in my you know whatever so but my guy uh, he he you know scaled back the wall and he came back <laughs> to the thing so that was one incident i i, I do remember fondly and uh, otherwise uh, you know the night time exercises in dehradun and all those uh, mountains all around and you see, you can look at dehradun from far of oh, it's uh, it's really wonderful yes yes really yes so sir uh, academy mein you didn't think ki uh, to opt for nine para or no no not was there never not academy i was uh, i was uh, i was at 20% you know because i said that uh, the aim is to just get commission i did not want actually you know because i had no mentor no nobody over there to guide me so i said you know let me just go through the paces very normally and uh, to start life and so and uh, so that's how i i took it quite easy i did whatever is mandatorily required to be done and i you know so just enjoyed being in the army and you know looking at things uh, like that so i had not thought yes i was very clear i will join infantry which is uh, you know one of the largest uh, fighting arm in the indian army that was very clear so all three options i had given of infantry only uh, but not uh, para i had given for bihar i i i joined five bihar five bihar is a unit which had uh, you know two olympians you know uh, dungdung and sushil topno 
and uh, also bihar regiment had a number of other there was one more person manohar topno at that time subsequently we had number of other players so i wanted to join them because and try and you know see if i can uh, play for services or things that because that was one passion which was still there so i joined five bihar and they you know they welcomed me uh, very nicely heartily yeah yes hockey was still at the back of your mind <laughs> during academy uh, days also. i had given up the dreams to play for the country i was very clear yeah. but i said that you know uh, so uh, and uh, so our unit at that time was uh, five bihar when i joined them they were deployed in siachen so yeah. i was heartily welcomed and we you know went over there and things like that in between it just so happened one very senior officer came and my commanding officer uh, introduced me and said sir he plays very good hockey so he said what are you doing here son why don't you take the northern command team so from there i you know we took a team and we we won the services championship you know uh, that was also a dream uh, for 3 4 months we were we made a team and it was uh, the only time i think uh, northern command uh, generally we, because they are deployed and uh, they don't send any teams or whatever team is sent is at the last moment but we won the services championship that was really you know <laughs> we remember it fondly and then of course i came back to siachen and yeah <laughs> yes sir so it was i think 1985 right when you were yeah. deployed in siachen uh, so just like after that. operation after meghdoot yeah yeah uh, no i i got commissioned in june 85 and uh, immediately okay. we were yeah 84 you're right the the army had gone there in 84 yeah. and we went there in 85 yeah they i think they went in end 84 or something in so yeah we got inducted in 85 so immediately after you know commissioning you know, went over there yes met them there so so how was the situation there when you went there if you could uh, explain since, a little uh, siachen at that time was you know uh, it's a it's a gateway actually siachen is a gateway and uh, it's a gateway to ladakh and into india so most of the you know the chinese and the mongolian marauders used to come through that pass Uh, you just have to scale and then you roll down into leh ladakh area and once you come there you enter into kashmir you can enter into himachal also from there so that was a very important pass to be held and uh, earlier it used to be where you know uh, only mountaineers used to go but uh, when suddenly some information was received at the higher uh, the thing that uh, maybe the other country has some you know plans Uh, so before they could uh, go and occupy siachen uh, the you know the indian army had planned it and they went and occupied all the higher reaches in a, such a strategic manner that is the soltor ridge ridge line that uh, no one can now come and uh, you know and siachen is uh, at 18000 feet and and above life over there at that time was very difficult because we were in you know uh, boot ri and jungle boots and things like that because we were just inducted subsequently uh the you know the sweden uh, swedish uh, you know shoes you know and uh, equipment and things like that came but uh, the initial uh, you know uh, one or two years there was hardly anything for us so physical fitness kept us uh, you know uh, motivated and uh, the, the whole indian army they did very well they held on to that and we had we suffered a lot of uh, weather casualties initially but uh, things fall into place you know the, the good systems in place so all the logistics also they they caught up and they did a good job so to koi combat experiences hue the wahan pe yeah so combat experiences hua tha unit ka hua tha uh, okay. but my you know my, what had happened was when i had gone in between to play for the command and the services championship so when i came back when I, you know i was super excited we had got a gold medal and things like that and our vehicle had broken down in between uh, you know pattapur one place where the brigade had quarter was there and the siachen uh, you know base camp in between when the vehicle got then we you know pushed it and it, you know in leh ladakh and the siachen areas you have to gradually move upwards you have to take you know 6 days break 7 days break and gradually scale the heights so as youngsters you know you feel you know to there everywhere it is written you know Uh, you can't be a gama you know in the area of lamas everywhere it is written but we are youngsters <laughs> we don't think uh, you know in those terms 
so we pushed the vehicle and we walked you know i think about 20 odd kilometers we walked and the first day we landed over there so i caught hapo so hapo is that high altitude pulmonary pulmonary oedema where water gets into your lungs so if you are not evacuated you can lose your life so i got evacuated and uh, then of course within about i think four to six weeks i came back so the commanding officer didn't want to send me to the higher reaches so he kept me in a midway then he brought me down from there also and he kept me as a admin officer in uh, chin base camp and then from there also he sent me backwards you know generally uh, the senior officers are very you know uh, protective of their young officers they know that these guys have you know more of josh and less of hosh <laughs> So that's how my, you know, I lost out on the uh, battle experience in Siachen. So just running between posts. But the unit did a very good job. You know, they were fighting off, uh, you know, the enemy. And they had a number of, uh, you know, actions at that time. Yes. So if you think about it now, so yeah. you were evacuated for HAPO and then you got recovered, you went back again. What yeah. made you do that, sir? Yeah, actually, uh, a person who gets hapo, the, the 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 military hospital at Le, the you know the officers they told me that you your lungs will collapse, you know there is no way you can go back. Uh, we will downgrade you, you know, uh, and we will send you backwards. You have to go to and you know you now you don't come back to Siachen. You can lose your life and things like that. I said there is no way, you know, nothing is going to happen to me. You have to send me. So they kept me one day, two day, three day, four day. Then they rang up my commanding officer. They said, he said, yeah, he's a mad chap. You send him because he'll not leave you. So then they, whatever, and they said, okay, and fine. They sent me back. They told me, take all precautions. I no precautions. I walked up to where my commanding officer was there in the middle of Siachen. He was deployed. So he was shocked. Hey, son, you walked all the way. Come on, you should have waited for some time. I said, sir, nothing is going to happen. If it has to happen, it will happen. So he kept me for some time with him. Uh, that is at the middle of Siachen. Then he was not happy. He said, no, no, you go down to Siachen base camp. So he kept me over there. So, But still, I, I didn't want to lose out. Then from there, he saw that I was not happy. So he sent me to, uh, you know, the, uh, Khardungla. Uh, Khardungla is the highest motorable pass. You know, that's the pass between Leh and this side of uh, the valley and the Siachen valley. So, so I was there for about six months. He said, okay, at the same height, I'm keeping you. So you, at least you, you will get a feel of what these heights are. So six months, uh, I looked after that uh, road because uh, that road has to be kept open for, you know, logistics to be pumped into this side of Shok Valley, they call it. Yeah. Right. How did 9 Para SF, uh, the thought of you joining Nine Paras have come into the picture, sir. Yeah. So what happened when I, you know, came back from, uh, you know, playing ho you know, hockey, and I realized that my dream is literally over. So I need to give up hockey, and now I will make uh, army as my career. So uh, permanently, and you know, no, no thinking of, you know, speaking of hockey now. So when I thought of that, then I said that, uh, and at that time Sri Lanka had started the, you know. Uh, the problems in Sri Lanka had started. And uh, Nine Para SF was deployed in Leh Ladakh area uh, just prior to their deployment over there. So uh, I was there and I, you know, I saw the battalion and they were superbly fit, uh, you know, people and, you know, things like that. And uh, they had come for their, you know, routine exercises and things like that. So I said that if I have to, you know, continue in the army, a, a person like me, we get bored very soon, you know. I mean, it, uh, routine things don't uh, appeal to us you know uh, so whatever it is so i told my commanding officer sir i have to go so he said damn it you are going nowhere <laughs> you have to stay here <laughs> nothing you are not leaving me so he said i will give you challenging task you don't worry so he gave me so many tasks uh, very good. i am in touch with him even today colonel aluwalia vk aluwalia so he kept me very busy sending me here, sending me there. Then he said, when we go down from Siachen, I will make you my adjutant and you know, lots of work. It's very challenging. It's not easy. You will not be able to handle it. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three bags full. But my mind was to go to Nine Para SF. So I kept telling him. And then, you know, I had a, uh, you know, a friend of mine. He was very senior to me. He was going to become a commanding officer. He was my instructor also when I had gone to do my young officer's course. So I, I shared with him. That's a, I'm bored over here. 
uh, you know infantry is a very good arm it's a fighting arm but they will fight once in you know 20 years now you are going down from here to peace time and they will be peace time soldiering it doesn't appeal to me i need to go to a special forces or a commando unit where every day is a challenge so he said no what i will do i will send you out every day so he and the, the you know second in command were, you know there was one lieutenant colonel bharat singh big mustache chap so both of them said to keep this guy busy every day they used to send me to one far away mountain and they will tell me you go over there and you get get us some meat from there the goat mountain goats are so fast every day i used to go and from kilometers they will see you and run away there is no question and your rifle is you know uh, about 500 meters range 300 to 500 meter there is no way you can go anywhere through they knew it but every day they should you come back empty and go back tomorrow again so every day at 6 i has to go come back at 6 in the evening so they were keeping me busy so one day i told my you know this uh, uh, at that time major rajinder singh sir you have to send me out he said yaar i am third in command i am not first nor second so i said okay so one uh, after a cup you know a couple of weeks he was posted out to another unit and he was a little upset so he i asked him sir what's happened what's happened to your mood you look a little down he said yeah the guys have already posted me out you know i am going to another unit so i said here's my chance so i told him sir you are going out you sign my volunteer certificate he said get it to me and <laughs> sign it so at that time the commanding officer and the second in command were on leave because we were going down from siachen and he signed it and i sent it off to ms branch immediately i was the officiating adjutant and uh, before you can say jack robinson my you know posting to ninth para at that time ninth para commando came and uh, before the you know the co and all joined also i went off to ninth para who were deployed in uh, you know sri lanka <laughs> that's how i i left and then i i didn't come back yeah, i stayed with them yes how was the reaction in pai bihar when you were yeah they are still my friends they are in touch with me <laughs> they they knew that you know i need to keep doing something so they try to tell me that see uh, you go to a special forces unit a commando unit there hardly any manpower because they work in very small numbers here we have large numbers but somehow you know it didn't appeal the commanding officer i told you he made me the adjutant he said see there's a lot of things you have to learn and all but you know, so they were a little sad when i left and i am still in touch with them uh, so <laughs> but i had to go <laughs> i had to go so i couldn't stop myself yeah <laughs> yes so sir you had a in those times your probation happened in sri lanka right you were directly deployed to sri lanka yeah yeah so uh, when you are in a battle like situation sri lanka was at its peak at that time and uh, so there is no time for probation so your probation is by fire so in and that is what you train for so when you when you are doing your probation they want to see your physical fitness and things like that so much more than that you are doing in operations you are going out for you know 3 days 4 days 6 days 7 days on the trot there is no sleep there is no water there is no food you are carrying such a heavy pack 30 40 kg you are doing you know navigation you know all your map reading and all that you are ensuring that your men are safe you are ensuring that you don't kill any civilian by mistake you know there are so many things you do it's far beyond any probation you know and in probation you are doing the same things but in a lesser scale and knowing that it is an exercise it's more of a buggery uh, here you are doing much more so my commanding officer at that time was you know uh, then uh, colonel t s pathak he subsequently rose up to be a deputy chief lieutenant general t s pathak a very fine gentleman so he told me that you have it in you he saw me in the beginning itself i, I had in uh, commandos also i had got a instructor grading so he had told me you are absolutely fit and fine and you have been in siachen so there is no training required for you so he used to send me on independent missions very far you know away we used to Uh, travel with just about 10 15 people and go right through wherever whatever is the task as a young officer with about 2 2 and a half years of service and uh, the men respected you because they knew you were superbly fit and uh, we used to go and come back with not a scratch and we used to accomplish our task so i really enjoyed uh, my you know my my tenure in the from the first day on of nine para sir yeah yes sir so So we've heard in like multiple places that when you join 
any special forces unit especially nine para as a new officer so your first command when you go and take the first command people are looking at you to understand how capable you are right hierarchy or ranks don't matter there so how was that experience for you yeah actually uh, unit like nine para sf or one para or 10 para all these specialized units uh, they don't wear ranks you never wear your ranks you don't wear your uniform you are in your you know combat t-shirt and things like that very informal and growth takes place in in a informal atmosphere if you are throwing your rank then uh, you are trying to you know uh, tell the other guy that uh, you are much superior and in when you are in a battle area battlefield area uh, the the bullet doesn't see who is senior or who is junior that's very clear so even your you know your, whoever your commando uh, on ground he can also be senior because it's a situational leadership in a situation nobody is senior nobody is junior the person at the site is the senior most he will take a decision so that is the way you know special forces uh, and commando troops operate nobody is senior nobody is junior the ground conditions and the situation will dictate who is the leader and we believe in leadership and not in being a commander there is a little difference between a commander and leader commander wears his ranks a leader is as per the situation anybody you have to be very flexible so in in a situation like this uh, it doesn't matter and i was uh, very frankly with all the sports background and things like that and looking for adventure and uh, leadership comes naturally to you your uh, leadership is not thrust on you you are grabbing situation opportunities and you know so uh, it felt like home it is like fish to water the men respect actually i remember my first uh, you know uh, was a very funny this thing that you know we had gone long uh, the, the the commanding officer is always trying to put you you know uh, give you you know places to operate where he knows that it is not very safe but also uh, safe enough to send a youngster so he had sent me on about uh, a very long range patrol you know he had given me and uh, where we had to walk for 3 days 3 nights con- continuously we had to walk and do a surveillance task and then to come back so what had happened was en route uh, you know some elephants were there when we were traveling at night we were moving through very thick jungles and those elephants uh, to avoid the elephants we swerved to the you know left and we walked a little further away there we saw you know to chase those elephants away the farmers were shooting at the elephants they were making a lot of noise with their shotguns you know so those bo- short bore guns which they were firing then we had to avoid them also to avoid them and so that they don't feel that you know we are, we are you know looking at them so we took a further detour from there and uh, from there then we then to come back uh, with the compasses you know uh, those days there were no gps you were walking with compass and and you know and outdated map sheets so to come back uh, so in the morning then we again had to and one guy of mine got left behind somewhere Uh, one radio set operator chap so we came back all the way hunting for him in the pitch dark night i located him you know he was uh, uh, next to a boulder because he had just you know we had we walked away and he must have you know taken a short nap or something so he was a radio operator so we told him okay come so we i remember his name panikar so we took panikar back and we went back and you know and then we went on to our mission and i forgot to inform my commanding officer that all is well in between uh, he had communicated and i had said sir there is a fire fight on but i am quite i think they are civilians i'll come back to you and i forgot you know as youngsters it <laughs> the situation is such i forgot about it and so the next day i saw a number of you know helicopters on top going i said thick jungles and where are these helicopters going and then uh, you know i happened to take a break somewhere and i said let me just speak to rear and find out so one of my you know friend at that time uh, Uh, he was i think uh, captain anil singhal so he told me yeah where the hell are you i said sir i am on my task he said what bloody task yesterday night you told us that you are in a fire fight and we are hunting for you we don't know where the hell are all of you safe i said sir all is well we are we're going he said no no you forget the task you <laughs> come running back <laughs> so i said sir we are very close to where we are supposed to go he said no no forget all of that the commanding officer wants you back because he says that probably you are veered off and we are launching uh, next day so he wants you before the you know the they move off so so we uh, jogged back to you know about 40 odd kilometers before the battalion was to get launched so we went back 
and uh, so the commanding officer was very mature uh, he did not speak a word to me he said come son all all well don't worry and he spoke to one of my senior guys and they all praised me they said sir what a youngster you got he didn't open fire he didn't get scared of the elephants he didn't get scared of those civilians firing at him he didn't allow us to fire and one of the guys that he stepped in route and he went back without losing his shirt and he we traced him back we found that guy and we walked back towards the mission you got a very good guy so and i didn't know what was happening so and i was least bothered you want to send me back i am ready to go back <laughs> i was very clear <laughs> that i am doing my bit and that's it so he he hugged me and he said yeah you've done a good job i said i am sorry you got a little delay and he said no no forget it that's okay uh, we'll leaving in another two hours so get ready we'll go back so and after that we went and he never looked back that commanding officer was the guy who told me time and again that you will be a legend and i had that was just by looking at me at the first operation so i said sir i don't know what you're talking about he said no you will not understand but i am telling you you will do really well in this battalion and you are a good guy so just keep it up and just conserve yourself so okay fine so you know the senior officers uh, you know they can see through whatever it is and we just need to do our bit so yeah so my probation was by fire <laughs> so he just accepted yes. it <laughs> like a like a really practical experience of what you were supposed to do in nine <laughs> para sir so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. so so your first proper combat would also have been in sri lanka and with nine para yeah, yeah. absolutely not... absolutely absolutely so can can you tell us little bit about that about huh. that experience yeah actually uh, you know i i will keep it uh, i will not give out the names and all just to be you know sure, sure. That, yes sir. you know so i remember you know uh, we uh, there was general nanavati at that time he was our you know he subsequently became our army commander also so he they had you know planned out uh, the task to go to you know because uh, ltt had moved out from uh, jaffna and all built up areas and they had gone to you know the uh, jungles of the northeast over there and so we had to you know pursue them and you know basically the aim was to try and you know persuade them to come back to the you know the table and to talk it out because we had gone there to help out the tamilians and the tamilian population were suffering and everyone wanted them to understand that there is no point of you know having a battle and fighting and things like that when uh, the government is trying to solve your problem but anyway so we pursued them into the jungles and uh, so that uh, i remember it was a special heliborn operations we were dropped in the middle of the uh, nowhere and we were given a task that you know you have to uh we, we had to move on that night about 12 odd kilometers to a camp where they felt there there's a large camp over there so i remember we just before last light you know the hepters three of three hepters dropped us and we you know walked towards and there were two rivers in the night we crossed and uh, you know so our time schedule got a little upset but at the uh, whole night we walked and i was uh, the leading troop commander so i remember at around uh, 4 or 4:30 in the morning i could see a fire from far i could see uh, some fire was in the middle of the jungle i knew fire that means militants are here so i i alerted everyone and we we were in three different parties you know the other two had gone off somewhere else where they were told and we were uh, with uh, uh, there used to be you know uh, god bless his soul major yadav with me he was my team commander so he you know he and i we were together and we when we were so i told him sir there is something ahead he said okay don't worry you you lead so i led and we crawled up to that place there was a huge cauldron and uh, there were about uh, 25 30 armed militants all around and they were brewing tea early in the morning and a huge fire so they were very clear that uh, there are no militants here and things like that uh no no you know there whomever they were scared of they knew the ipk were around and they would have heard the hepters dropping so they had left their camp where we were to hit and because we had swerved a little from because of those uh, two rivers we had crossed we had swerved a little so we swerved to where you know instead of hitting the camp we hit left and where they had left their camp and camp. it was just a coincidence so when we came quite close to them you know surprise broke because uh, there were some of their you know sentries on uh, left and right also deployed and suddenly you know all hell broke loose and uh, 
when the visibility is very less, you know, you can't open fire because you are not very sure whether there are civilians or things like that. So we didn't open fire. So we didn't open fire and uh, then we searched that area and they just vamoosed from there. And it was pitch dark night uh, around 4, 4.30. And with jungles, it is more uh, this thing. So we hunted all around and then we found all their haversacks and we found so much of battle equipment over there. So General Nanavati was in the air at that time and he said, no, you have to pursue them. So in, in small groups of threes and fives, we pursued them. And uh, all, the rest, all parties, you know, came back by 10 a.m. And But I had with my five guys, we tracked them down. I, I know Tamil. I have studied in Tamil Nadu. So, so I could, you know, uh, speak to civilians and things like that. But of course, there were no civilians there. But we tracked them. We got something here, a biscuit there, uh, around here, around there. And then we went and, uh, you know, uh, we, we found their, one of their camps. And uh, so that's how... So that was my first, you know, this thing. So we assaulted them and uh, then whatever. And then we stayed the night there, just five of us. And they didn't know that we were just five of us. So though my commander told me and my commanding officer also told me I fall back. Uh, they are in large numbers. So I said, sir, nothing will happen. Don't worry. So, you know, when you are young, you don't listen, you know. And <laughs> it's a big problem for the senior officers, <laughs> mad people like us. We don't listen. He said, sir, nothing will happen. <laughs> he says, yeah, you bloody will lose your life. In the night, they will assault you. You can't be awake the whole night. I said, sir, nothing will happen. We will not sleep also. And if they come assault us, we will assault them back. So, night, they didn't come to us. We were inside their camp and all of them were outside the camp. <laughs> we had occupied their camp and anyway so so next day the commanding officer somehow said yeah son please yeah please come back you ready just come out from there come and link up with all of us and then we will assault that camp and anyway so i said okay sir but when it is first light when i see proper light and all then i will come in the dark i don't want to come because i don't know who is where and i whole night i heard you know sounds all around said okay so we made a fighting breakthrough and we fired and we moved out so we could easily move out from there and linked up and then nanavati said yeah show us where you are so we showed and then he told us you are way off from where you were supposed to be and things like that so but that was my first uh you know uh baptism where you know we, we hit a camp right. so <laughs> yeah. yeah so so uh in one of our podcasts, uh, our guest used also mentioned that when a bullet is getting fired at you, that is the biggest high that you can get. Was that the same for you as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, uh, we uh, I mentioned earlier also in one of the podcasts that, you know, uh, uh, we uh, I am from Rajasthan and we draw a lineage from Rana Pratap. When Rana Pratap lost to the Mughals, he divided his army. He said, I don't want my army to suffer along with me. Till I make a plan and till I see what how to fight the Mughals back, he sent us to various places. And so we came towards Raja of Mysore. Uh, that's what we have been told. And uh, after service over there, he gave these soldiers pattas of land. And so between uh, Andhra and Tamil Nadu border, we still have land. I have land still over here. So, uh, so we draw lineage from there. So I am very clear in hundreds of firefights I have been, I have entered rooms, I have entered buildings, I have entered jungles, camps, hideouts, I assaulted, you know, so many, you know, locations mine, through minefields, not a sweat and never did I breathe hard, not even once. Uh, you feel you are doing your duty and you know you are in the correct place. So when you have this type of a feeling that, you know, all is going well, and you are in the correct place and your mind is absolutely, you know, crystal clear of what is happening. You are visualizing what is happening behind you, ahead of you, flanks of you. Where is the fire coming from? You are absolutely normal. So I enjoyed my, you know, my tenure with, you know, about 21 odd years with uh, 9 para SF, uh, in and on, you know, coming in field as staff and then coming back to the unit, then going out and coming back. But our regimental life, about 20, 21 years, you are associated with a fighting unit and you know you are in the correct place. So yes, you felt that everything is going well and not a scratch, touch wood. So not a scratch on me in spite of and on my people who, are, who were with me. So 
yes you 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 do feel that you are in the correct and a unit like nine para sir i remember sri lanka we were there for two and a half years we had about nine casualties only nine casualties and most of them were battle casualties that is uh, accidents battle accidents that is someone had drowned someone got electrocuted there was one you know i remember one motor motor accident you know things like that so when you you are trained very well and uh, you are following the battle you know procedures battlefield discipline very well you are very super conscious of where the fire is coming from you are not opening fire you know things like that so uh, you don't suffer casualties of course luck also does play 5% luck is there you have to keep that in mind right sir uh, what made sri lanka so challenging what terrain of course was very challenging but the surroundings which were things that were happening was it also a challenging scenario when you were operating yeah you see we went to help the civilians we went to help uh, the accord the accord was signed and uh, you know the government had signed the accord in very good faith with the sri lankan government and the party ldt had also party to it and we felt everything is going well and uh, in an accord uh, always it happens any accord you see there will be one party visit which is disgruntled but you can't get everything you know so and you, it was like uh, they wanted a complete you know a break from the other country from sri lanka which is not possible if india would have got it uh, done that then uh, somebody would have cut northeast from us somebody would have cut kashmir from us you know they are always bigger players also so united nations uh, resolutions uh, and policies have to be followed you you can't you see today all the places where war is taking place whether it is ukraine whether it is syria you name a country where war is taking place today uh, like gaza you know palestinians and israel they are all fighting you can't carve a country out of another country there is no way the world will not accept it so at that time also our government was very clear that we cannot carve a country out of a country an autonomous council is what can be given and under those circumstances the world had accepted it so if the militants did not accept it uh, we were you know we were not trying to we were just putting pressure on them see the indian army also was playing a waiting game and that's what happens in northeast also that's what happened in kashmir also that's what happens in naxalite areas the armed forces are not trying to you know kill uh, you know militants they are trying to put pressure on the leadership and when you try and put pressure on the leadership of the militants and terrorists and things like that the message does go across and uh, we were talking to civilians over there and the civilians over there the tamil population were very sympathetic to us they never gave us away nothing they fed us they clothed us we had no food we were traveling hundreds of kilometers they used to feed us even though their sons were fighting against us so the situation was very complex i would say uh, subsequently the ltt had joined the sri lankan army they became friends for 17 years they were fighting with each other then they ganged up against us so that is the time i think the government decided that you know enough is enough and that he, they pulled out ipk from there but we tried our best is what i can say and we tried to and uh, the government was very clear they did not want to kill prabhakaran we could have thrice we assaulted his camp we could have you know we had everything with us we had all the heavy weapons with us so the government tried to you know uh, tried to take both the sides that is the sri lankans also such a large country like ours neither we can you know browbeat somebody nor we could browbeat a population which is unhappy population was of course was being you know not treated well so there was a problem and we were trying to look for a solution it was a very complex situation i think it went out of hand uh, with hot headedness and then so many countries you know muck it up they want to create a problem for india you see even here in today's situation also everyone wants to bring down your country anyone and everyone wants to tear your country down Uh, the militants also have said we can't get kashmir so we will enter all the st- uh, cities of india and we will bleed them from from their cities and from their towns so uh, the situation is very dynamic uh, warfare is changing you know so you may not find uh, real battles uh, and wars you may find the uh, other type of wars which are now taking place your metros can suddenly stop your airports can be uh, you know assaulted your cyber warfare can take over so there are so many ways in which to they want to basically bring down your system 
your governing system so it is a it was a complex situation at that time as youngsters also you know we understood that uh, uh, these terrorists uh, that is that, that, that these militants are not uh, they, they they don't want to listen to the government and they were also very clear everywhere they were writing you know ipk have go back ipk have go back we don't want to fight you we don't want back. they were also very clear we were also you know they are our own kith and kin we don't want to fight them so and we didn't assault any sri lankan army or armed force or something like that even though we knew that they there was some tacit support between them subsequently so the government decided better to withdraw from there so it was a it it was a very complex situation and we didn't want to harm our own state also we have you know tamils here also so we love our tamilians i have stayed in tamil nadu i love the people are really good they are, they are they are very intelligent they are very mature they understand everything so i think uh, and it was a difficult uh, the government was new they were new young uh, we, in 84 we had lost indra gandhi so and they were, the government was new and so they maybe whatever it is but the politicians were very mature and they handled it very well it just so happened that you know things didn't fall into place i, I don't know beyond yes that. so uh, kabhi aisa indian army ke man mein tha that what what are we doing here during ipkf was there ever a feeling like that no see the, the 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 indian army right from the beginning if you see you know whatever you you see second world war you see the sardars the sikhs the way they fought they fought in 1918 also the indian army fought so many wars in 1918 the army is with the government you know with the system so and that is how what discipline is all about so in the second world war also the indian army fought so many wars so so we uh, as soldiers you are you are bound to the you know the constitution uh, whatever you are told you have to do you cannot question there is no way you can if you are questioning then you are going wrong so we never had a doubt we never even thought for a day for an hour for a minute also what are we doing here we wanted to serve the nation and we said that this is a problem which is at our backyard and if we do not try and solve this somebody else will come inside here we were very clear on that so we worked day and night trying to put pressure on the militants to come to the table to the dialogue and go get back into the process we were very clear so there was no disgruntlement anywhere yes the minds they were using were tremendous as per the united nations you know the rules uh, you have to use a very small amount of explosives in the mines these guys were using mines uh, explosives to such an extent i saw so many boots you know the whole foot flies backwards when you step on a mine so that type of a, the 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 vehicles were blowing up the tanks they were getting you know the, the apcs of our so that the amount of explosives they were using was massive so yes they were not fighting by the rules we were fighting by the rules and they, but that is how it is you know uh, that is how they were in less numbers we were in huge numbers and we were trying to just t- tell them to come to the dialogue so so it was a, a when you fight in a you know insurgency area or a terrorist zone area uh, your iq level has to be 4 out of 5 you have to understand what is happening because there is it is not a conventional war where the enemy is just in the front across the boundary so that if the junior leaders and today's junior leaders are very good excellent not only junior leaders the men they understand everything you don't have to you know brief them much so then also we understood that our iq level has to be very high there should be you know the, and our aim was very clear to get them to the dialogue table that's it and the other agencies of ours whether it is you know the raw the ib all of the other agencies of ours were trying to get them to the table so it was a complex situation right sir and also very unpredictable anything very, can happen at any point of time yeah very unpredictable because uh, you know uh, we were not able to understand uh, where were the weapons coming from you can catch hundreds of weapons and hundreds of weapons is to come thousands of weapons is to come and uh, that the, because of the coastline the coastline was massive so and their camps also their camps were in such a place where three sides they used to be sea and one side used to be the sinhala area the sri lankan area so from whichever way you come they used to come to know 
and their escape route used to be out through the sea they had motor boats all all over you know and they had you know, they had fought for 17 years before uh, you know we came we met them they had fought for they had they were they were they were, they knew the terrain backwards we had no maps we, we had map where something was written here 20 kilometers away some villages written there nothing in between and they were all jungles so there was nothing actually for us but i would say to the credit of the indian army that uh, the battalions which fought over there uh, because of the experience they gained over there suddenly in the you know late 80s that is around 88 80, 89 88 89 90s uh, jnk erupted because that was the situation when the uh, you know the neighboring country thought that it's a good situation indian army is embroiled in sri lanka let's make an attempt in uh, kashmir and so those battalions which had done very well in sri lanka and who had gone through this type of we could hold kashmir where so many foreign militants and hundreds and hundreds had come we 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 so probably it was a good thing we we fought over there we understood everything and when we were flown out to kashmir we held the the state very well we held until date there is no problem so i think it was whatever happens is for the good right so after ipkf you were flown directly to kashmir in the yeah. insurgency uh, yeah. area we i remember we we flew out and uh, we had to establish you know counter insurgency schools because kashmir suddenly erupted uh, they were infiltrating in large numbers you know in hundreds they were infiltrating and uh, the chaos and you, you saw that movie also you know kashmir uh, the kashmiri pandits the way they were being treated the houses were being burnt and things like that so uh, suddenly you know uh, all of that happened so from uh, uh, sri lanka we flew straight to we were flown out to uh, you know kashmir and deployed all over so that thing started we established uh, two schools also uh, to train the you know the areas in uh, north of pir panjal and south of pir panjal and uh, so yes uh, so for me it was uh, siachen then sri lanka then kashmir so i was on the trot <laughs> i was enjoying it <laughs> always always in the thick of things yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i was enjoying it yeah soldiering was something very close to my heart yes sir so uh, when we talk about ins- insurgency in kashmir sir so jaise aapne bataya it was in large numbers so yeah so when you were going for operations right so suppose you are hitting a camp so how much numbers were you e- expecting at that point was there any like a uh, idea or it could have been anything no it could have been anything it could have been anything because uh, you know uh, when you we, we are as it is operating in very small numbers the special forces operates in very small numbers that we call it squads and you know troops and things like that very small numbers and um, so and uh, because the aim is not to hit we are the eyes and ears of the conventional forces so and for life situation training we go into such areas because you you keep training for you know preparing for whenever the balloon goes up so when we are operating in small numbers whatever is the num- whatever be the number across us we are very confident of taking them on and you don't have to take them on also it's like a football match so many times in contact you go left you go right you go left you go back you go from anywhere you assault him so that bugger runs you know so we have so many times we have fought where we have not fought head on so you just kept somebody to keep that guy's head down and we have skirted and hit him from the flank he has withdrawn again that party is you know the, you by leaps and bounds leaps and bounds so one leg is on the ground and the other leg is moving that leg is on the ground the other one moves so it's like a football match so we are making that guy run so when he, when that other guy is running then he is losing his center of gravity every time we have made him move so if you make a the other person move then you have won half the battle so it does not matter i remember once we were just eight of us and we had assaulted a strength of about 14 people all 14 armed and we had expected just three or four to be there so when we saw a large strength of 14 people it was you know all hell broke loose so either it was them or us we we killed each one of them every one 14 of them and we were just eight of us so each guy had you know had to do is even if one of us had not played up that day we would have 
we did not get a scratch we didn't get a scratch we assaulted them so and when you assault somebody uh, then you are moving you are you're not hiding behind trees and boulders and things like that. you assault them and you assault them and constantly moving each one is a leader each one is a leader in such a time so when each one is a leader there is no one shouting around and giving orders and things like that you just do it's like a football game a cricket game or wherever you understand what is happening and you take the initiative yeah right sir so any operation in kashmir jahan pe aapko laga tha ki bas abhi to nikalna mushkil hai yahan se is any 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 kind of operation of like that <laughs> no <laughs> no no not not at all not at all uh, so many operations we've been through uh, yes uh, i can tell you so many of them but i'll tell you you know uh, in in kashmir when you go out for operations you start walking just before last light because you have to walk the whole night the the these guys are on the you know not on the ridge line they are on top they are looking down like eagles are watching down and they know the routes you you cannot come cross country in in these mountainous terrain you have to use small routes and they know all the routes which are coming up so they are watching you from the, the and you have to walk the whole night so we had some information and uh, so uh, so there were uh, you know two parties of ours going uh at that time you know there was a now he's a general major general bains so he was at that time a major and i was also a major so we both said you assault from one side and i will come from the other side and i told him that i am taking being the senior most i will take the longer route and i will assault from top you come from the ground and he was in between so we said okay fine he said don't worry sir and uh, you you come from there and i told him for me i not only i have to climb the ridge which is massive it was peer panjal range and i was taking a route which was like a cliff assault and uh, we were about uh, 35 40 of us and there was a infiltrating group which we knew afghani group which was in the center so an uh, information we had and so we knew where they were exactly we knew the area backward so i said i am coming from top so in your uh, this thing because you have to walk just about 3 4 hours i will be walking about 12 to 16 hours so uh, don't uh, you know come before i have come uh, reached over there he said don't worry sir so we walked the whole night it was literally a cliff assault and uh, when we were rolling down uh, we could see their movement there were four to six of them and they the other side was the valley so but what had happened was they were they were not looking at us they were looking down because downwards bains had started his movement so between them and us you know so we he came from down and we rolled down from the top and we came to a stage where we could you know uh, we knew that now they are between us and there was a you know a cliff on the other side there was no pass for them to go so we were deliberately looking for them when suddenly we saw that you know there was a small trail and uh, they just jumped across about four or four of them we counted uh, heavily armed they went across into the valley so and uh, we had uh, that it was about uh, this was about 4 uh, in the evening so we had started walking 4 in the evening and the next day it was 4 in the evening so uh, these guys are like mountain rats they are like mountain rats and uh, to trap them is very difficult in at those heights also these agbanis they can run they can move you know they can breathe very well of course they are, they don't carry uh, you know equipment because the they were being fed they have a overground party and they know where to find them we are always carrying about 20 30 kg we have to you know uh, th- so that weighs us down and we can't leave it behind you know so that little bit of problem is there so that operation i do remember you know we were a little frustrated but n- never did we ever feel that there is no way out we knew we had the upper hand always and every time this is our area you know so we are fighting for our motherland so we were very clear our motivation was very high any soldiers for that matter so, yeah yes sir.
sir you ma- you have served with uh, colonel john de brito sir as well yeah yeah he was my commanding yeah, officer yeah. he was my team commander yeah. also very fine gentleman yes so can you tell us something about him any stories because we've seen pictures of him uh, just wanted to know yeah he uh, he's an excellent soldier the ground soldier excellent soldier very good human being uh, you know and um, he is the type of person who maintains a very low profile he doesn't like to you know speak up much and, and uh, he is the one he he likes to write a lot so he writes on you know standing operating procedures anything and everything he is noting it down and he is constant he he likes uh, you know signals and communication so all the radio sets and things like that he is listening to them always intercepting you know the messages of the militants you know so he has an eye for that he studies the ground a lot you know and uh, he is always smiling he is very positive and he is always wanting to teach anybody and everybody who wants to learn uh, and uh, uh, he used to be very m- methodical in his planning he used to plan a lot so for anything and everything he plans so people like us we first jump and then we plan he is, he has a very systematic and a logical mind so he plans a lot and you know he writes down everything and he uh, you know uh, and he is very cunning also so he understands he is the one who taught us you have to have even jal nanavati told us the same thing that you have to have guile when you enter a battlefield if you don't have guile you will get shot so this jal nanavati and uh, colonel john de brito he mentioned this to us youngsters you must be cunning if the enemy is firing at you then there is something don't go by that fire there is something else waiting for you if you see a ied that is a improvised explosive device he wants you to see it so that means there are 2 3 4 6 where you are taking a position where you are hiding expect a id over there so this this thing about being you know being cunning having guile look for something which is not obvious these are things which these two gentlemen taught us so we are very grateful to them uh, john de brito of course is an excellent soldier very down to earth and very good person Okay. I would not like sir, to say how... much about him because he likes to maintain the low profile. <laughs> yes. Sir. How do we? Just one question, sir. How do we reach him? In uh, he will he will hear hear what you have to say. <laughs> he will get in touch with you <laughs> if he wants to. He wants to. <laughs> right, sir. So, sir, like you mentioned, right? Up uh, Kashmir and in those times was very like it had become uh, very volatile. so abhi bhi we hear a lot about uh, kashmir becoming act- active again especially the rajouri and the poon sectors we have seen the operation of uh, captain shubham gupta sena med so why do you think uh, this has picked up again what happened aditya as i mentioned you know uh, the times have changed now it's a very good question you are asking uh, firstly i would like to mention about article 370 Uh, in my times when we were fighting and we used to kill militants uh, with weapons the they used to say that you know uh, no you have planted those weapons and we have we have so many people around us who have uh, killed them in a you know fire fight they used to say no you have planted them you, have, you they are not civ- they are not this thing they are civilians they are so earlier the problem before article 370 was that a fir used to be filed against you Everybody and anybody you kill, they say, "No, no, this is civilian. So you have killed him. You have put a weapon on him, and things like that." So we knew that they are being coerced because wherever the roads are there, three to four kilometers this side and that side is where the armed forces are there. But the hinterland was being ruled by uh, the militants, and the militants were ruling the maximum over there because you can you cannot deploy so much of force. How much can you deploy? You know, so. so this was the problem over there before article 370 was abrogated today article th- so every guy thought he was a freedom fighter so people from sudanese you know you name a country they were over here fighting uh, for something which was uh, just a uh, you know it was a psychological game everyone thought that muslims over here are being you know ill treated it that is not the case 
this is a proxy war so before article 370 was removed everyone you know was told that you know the muslims are being ill treated and uh, this country you know is suffering and the people are suffering and uh, we are all fighting all this was a, a, a psychological game uh, the other side uh, for their own you know uh, reason whatever they were trying to ensure that this type of proxy war not only them there are some other countries also who are trying to keep this you know uh, cauldron alive you know burning now article 370 has been removed today it is a law and order situation if anyone takes up an arm it is a law and order problem there is no freedom fighting today it is such a big thing which has taken place now with 370 gone the army need not carry out operations the police can carry out operations it's a law and order situation the crpf will control the situation the bsf will control the situation earlier they were coming in hordes and hordes because article 370 was there, not there, was there today article 370 is not there they will be tried just like you go into any other country and you so it is not a disturbed area today india has reclaimed it and has said there is no article this is a part and parcel of india and things like that you see the drastic change which has taken place in kashmir they are trying to keep it alive but they are all foreigners they are all foreigners who are trying to prop up something like i said you know everyone wants to keep the other country boiling so that economically you don't grow that's it they have kept us bleeding for 75 years and more so that is the aim so i i, I so today the situation has changed and uh, the the government has announced thousands of crores of investment in kashmir today earlier it was not there today kashmir is growing the maximum number of uh, visitors have come this year to kashmir and last year was also there it will continue to grow kashmir kashmiris have also seen that being in the mainstream is the only way out pakistan is a failed state so where are you looking that side pakistan is not they are not able to look after themselves where will they look after you so this realization has come that today the whole world is a village a global village we are connected with each other there are systems in place who are ruling so you have to follow norms and you know for administration and things like that you don't have to be so get embroiled in these types of things so kashmir is a changed state is what i sincerely feel because i have seen it since you know 85 i went and i have been seeing it day in and day out every pocket of kashmir i have walked so all three places whether it is you know jammu and that is the uh, leh ladakh area or the valley or south of pir panjal everywhere the people are very good the population is very good there is no problem absolutely they accommodate each other all these are being generated by a another country on behalf of another country so you see it basically it's a economical a warfare is for the economy they want to you see you saw you saw sterilite that is in tutigon you saw the copper industry that copper industry which was brought down was earning 19 crores profit a day and it was harming chinese interests so what did they do they brought all their ngos even kundan kulam the nuclear reactor which we are building with the help of russian so many ngos came and created this is what is proxy war our population has to understand what is happening in delhi you saw when uh, the president of america had come at that time delhi had become a battle zone suddenly where did they all come up when when the terrorists said in 2004 5 that we cannot take kashmir so now we will bleed india by entering their towns and villages and we will exploit you know the communal divide and all the diversity which is here we have to understand what is happening this is what is war we don't let uh, things escalate and don't pay attention to these you know what is all this you know these religious religion is a private matter whom i pray is none of anybody else's business i can pray to anywhere how does it matter it's a it should be kept out of the purview of the public i can pray anywhere and i i'll so be it the constitution the country is most important so and anyone takes up a gun is against the constitution 
if you look at it in those simple terms then the public will understand that and they will keep these people out it is the 2% population 2% of our population who are uh, you know uh, giving shrey to these people that's it only 2% so for 2% you don't uh, condemn somebody you you find out that 2% and you take them to task 98% are neutral so you have to be fair and you have to seem also to be fair so it is not kashmiris or anyone any religion which is involved in all of this no it is a war by a third country being helped by another big country that is what it is yeah so it's like a conscious effort to sabotage what whatever progress india is trying to make yes and we will become super pass they are just yeah. wanting to delay it so you have to know what is happening and just uh, hold your hold don't have to be so impatient and you know be judgmental and be so sensitive and things like that don't go by the media also or the media is all paid media they will write what you don't want to hear what you are scared of they will tell you so don't be scared of things stand up and speak if you have to speak but you don't have to you know get into these issues which are against the constitution that is supreme and slowly and gradually we are moving towards that we are speaking okay. our mind we are not holding back from yeah. speaking whatever it is in whatever is in interest for us so Absolutely. that change is happening yeah you, you you see where you know everyone you know says muslim 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 where are the muslims come from they all convert is yeah 95% of them are hindus yeah. all the people over here you know are you know they are all from this place only just 2 to 3% came from across and where they are no one knows they are all your kith and kin your brethren and they are all humans so it is politics there is nothing else it's just power politics so and we have to understand that so don't allow anyone to divide us you see you know long back i remember you know i was posted to united nations uh, to angola and uh, in angola in un you know they give you a break uh, once in 3 months or four months something so we had taken a break and gone to south africa pretoria and uh, there uh, we stayed in a motel uh, we couldn't afford the hotel charges so there was a motel we were staying and there were a couple of other you know uh, and they, i remember there was a us couple there there was uh, somebody from australia uh, a couple of others and we were three four of army officers so in the evening they asked us you know india this was i'm talking of 98 99 so they said you know india will become a superpower so we said of course we knew we know india is going to become a superpower so they laughed because they were they were you know they were about 15 20 years elder to us so they laughed they said, look at their arrogance anyway so they said okay we are two hours we are here for dinner and things so before we break off for the night you have to tell us the reason why you are going to become the superpower so so we said sir we think uh, india and nuclear is a no uh, sir missile program no we gave so many you know answers to them said no so finally you know uh, in the evening before we broke off uh, you know we asked that uh, those people that sir why do you think india will become the superpower so they laughed they said the way your population is growing and your youth is growing you are going to with your population capture all the countries of the world your prime your people will be our prime ministers our presidents and you see we have left our country and we have come for a holiday to this place why because the places we used to visit their indians are visiting <laughs> so so that is what is happening you see that this was 25 years or so back uh, 25 26 years back where they were very clear that indians are going to spread across the world and they are going to become see you see uk you have a indian over there so many countries you have indian origin people over there and that is what is going to happen indians are going to go to the very hard working people you, you go to united nations they want only indian volunteers and indian you know Uh, executives why because we are very conscientious people we work very hard and they want people who work so so why should we ax our foot we just have to see that we should not divide we should not divide ourselves and fall prey to these schemes 
which somebody is doing on somebody's behalf because of economy, nothing else. They don't want Arunachal Pradesh. They don't want anything. What will they do with Arunachal Pradesh? Nothing. They can't control their own such a vast area. What will they do with this? So it is nothing to do with Arunachal Pradesh. So it is something more. And that is to keep us below a threshold. And we have to understand this. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Sir, so like the operation of uh, Captain Shubham Gupta, Sena Medal, right? The operation that he was a part of. So uh, special forces officers, ka casualty hona, it's a little difficult to understand. So yeah. could you please like shed light on what could have happened? Yeah, uh, you know, uh... Uh, as I mentioned earlier also, that it is a little difficult, you know, operating in these areas, uh, the jungles. Firstly, you have to walk at night and you have to walk in pitch dark nights. Even on moonlit nights, we don't walk. So pitch dark night, you have to walk and uh, the jungles, the visibility is very less. And uh, the initiative is with the person who is not moving. And the special forces are always moving at night in very small numbers. So the first shot can be taken by a person who is their sentry. If you have hit their, I doubt. You know, uh, camp is something which is there in a neutral country. So there are no camps inside India. The camps are all across. So here you have just hideouts and hideouts are temporary. Or they have, you know, caves and things like that where they stay. So what they do is the routes on which we can come those routes, their sentry will be sitting on the route or just on left or right of the route, but he is watching you. And he he is like a snake. You have seen a snake. The snake, unless you have stepped on it, it will not bite. We have slept in jungles and we have walked across so many places. A snake has never bitten. He has walked across, over your, you know, he slipped across your legs, your arms. If you just lie logo nothing the snake just goes away but when it is scared it bites same thing is with the militant if you are hitting his hideout going straight towards him he will open fire if you are going left or right of him he will not open fire he does not want to give away his position because if he gives away the position then this place is out and the terrain dictates how many places he has he doesn't have too many places to hide so he is like a snake. So what happens is when we walk at night and we are hitting his hideout, we for certain do not know where his hideout is. He can make a small foxhole and make that his hideout anywhere. So we are we are probing for him. But that probe and that uh, uh, surprise factor, that tactical surprise factor is lost when you hit onto him. He can see you, hear you from say about 25, 30, 50 meters max. He knows you have come. You do not know him. Even though you are, you have got your night goggles, you have got your night binoculars, you are watching, but he is not moving. If he moves even an inch, we will know there is something. So when he is not moving and you are dead on him, the first shot is his. And he cannot afford to miss. So when he has hit the first shot, and our chap drops, there is no way we are going to go backwards. No way. If you move even an inch backwards, he will drag your guy's body, your weapon, and for life, we will not be able to look at ourselves. So we are very clear, if we have taken the first shot, even if we are in the open, we will wait there till we have taken our person back. Now, when, you know, something like this, what you just said happens. So, this is what happens. But our drills are very clear. What happens is, there is a party which stays there with the person who is hit. That just one or two, three people stay there. Two buddies. That is two on one side, two on one side. The rest are assaulting from another location. So we know that the person who has been hit and he is lying there in front of you has to be pulled out. So you leave two buddies there, one buddy there, whatever, somebody is there. 
the rest of them are rushing from left and right and assaulting that position now the the militants are also not fools they know that you are going to assault them from left and right so they will choose a position where you cannot assault them from the flanks there would be straight cliffs or you know something like that or there would be a you know a deep caves down uh, sort of a khai down you will not be able to come from there so they also choose their ground where they are going to sit generally they sit in a place which is unassaultable so then what happens then you have to take a frontal assault only when you go for a frontal assault can you pull your person back so one party goes for the assault the other party pulls your guys out so what is the ground situation is very difficult to say i can just say that the militants would have got lucky and they have hit our guy and once he has been hit the others it's a drill it's a drill you will not leave him behind you will assault and when you assault you are moving the other is they are all and the guy over there what happens is aditya the he has seen you from far that you are coming and you are coming bang on so what he does he wakes up the others so the complete lot would be deployed in a manner in which they know from where all you are going to come once the fire is opened so assaulting a defensive position is very difficult very difficult if you if you if you have seen that kandahar movie where you know in history they were just about uh, you know one platoon of sikhs only one platoon of sikhs which had held off 1000 that is one battalion strength of the afghanis 1000 strength that is what a defensive position is if you have located it well and these you know insurgents and terrorists know how to use the land so they would have selected a position and they would have been waiting they know that you know the special forces are around and so also uh, when you have gone bang on to them probing you are probing and you are going at you don't know for sure he is there and you take a hit so then this is what happens right so sir uh, do you see any difference between how uh, nine paras have used to operate then uh, during the early 90s and how it operates now why i'm asking is because uh, there was a podcast of major vivek jacob sir and he mentioned that it's a hunting party which goes in the jungles uh, during operations so do you think there's a difference between that time and now yeah you, you see yes there is a lot of difference and the the battlefield keeps evolving there a lot of security you know gadgetry the security gadgetry is what has elevated the battlefield made it more transparent and uh, the special forces carry all type of gadgetry all types of gadgetry and as per the as per the ground situation so when you carry this type of gadgetry the you are making it transparent but what happens is it also has got its limitations that is you may not be able to for sure no but you once the surprise is lost and fire fight starts then the gadgetry comes in play what i'm trying to understand uh, make you understand is that see shubham got a hit so you cannot con- constantly keep using the binoculars and you know thermal seekers heat seekers con- if you using that you will not make even 1 km you have to walk 12 15 km in one night so what happens is when a contact takes place fire fight starts that is when the gadgetry comes into play of course once a while you are sweeping that also where you feel that there is something you are swe- sweeping and you are trying to check the area or you are using the drone to try and find out what is happening but you can't constantly be doing that and in a, in a conventional war conventional war you will do all of that because time is not a constraint here time is a constraint there in conventional war you can't lose ground here there is nothing known as holding ground this is your own land so battlefield changes constantly what we fought in sri lanka what we fought in siachen and today the battlefield is totally different you get all information before you enter the battlefield today you are briefed by all the specialists 
so everyone briefs you and you are also carrying so much of gadgetry and in a in a firefight when it starts all the experts are on in line with you they are briefing you there's something here there's something here there's something moving here there's something moving there there's one party which is being briefed behind there's a drone which has which has caught sight of them you know so the battlefield is transparent but with all of that also the firefight remains a firefight the use of land remains the same earlier what we used to do is we used to go after the complete terrorist cadre so gradually what has happened is we have realized that no point of getting after this terrorist cadre it's the leader so when i was a commanding officer also we decided we are not going for the numbers we are going to only kill and neutralize the terrorist leaders that's it and what is the difference between a sf guy and somebody else so the senior leaders told us that you leave all this terrorist uh, cadre cadres will be taken care by others you go after the leaders you get us information you 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 work on long term you know strategy so, and you are briefed by you know various bodies so we were working on those types of things so battlefield keeps changing yes and battlefield is totally different from what it was earlier more sophisticated weaponry has come more, the you know more sophisticated security gadgetry has come uh, surveillance systems have increased tremendously and uh, even these guys are you know uh, they come fully loaded fully loaded uh, i i remember you know uh, uh, in in the area of noshera uh, there is a fort over there so uh, at that time you know jal nanavati was the army commander and he had sent us and uh, uh, my co at that time was colonel mohan i was the second in command so he had they had all said that this is a completely hindu belt noshera area there is a fort pandu fort they call it and they said ki yaar yahan se there is some some movement taking place here while it's a hindu area we we feel probably militants will not come from here but some movement is taking place so i was told you you know go over there and i you know we went and i taken at that time one captain hooked up with me so we went over there and we did a lot of study and then we realized that it is in a minefield some movement is taking place inside a minefield so we deployed ourselves we were about 8 10 of us we had our you know all the latest gadgetry even at that time so i told him that see i will be sitting ahead you sit behind with a little larger party and behind you you keep the complete infantry so when the infiltration party comes i will inform you they have crossed me and uh, you see which direction they are coming if they are coming straight to you you knock them off if they have bypassed you from left and right you tell the infantry which is behind you which is the direction they are coming in you knock them off so so i was ahead almost at the line of control or maybe a little ahead whatever so i saw them counted 1 2 3 4 four guys crossed us we were two or two three of us who was he must have crossed us from just not even 2 3 meters so and you know there was a water body that is a small nala where we were sitting just like in the, on the wall we had made places for ourselves on the wall and 1 2 3 4 and they, the packs were heavy huge packs they were wearing so as soon as they crossed us we told uda that bhai wo aa gaye char bande hain aur dono ke beech mein bandon ke beech mein 10 10 meter ka gap so they are coming straight to you and where you are sitting there so after some time he radioed back and said yes i see them okay and then we now what happens is the surveillance party in the front when the militants terrorists have crossed you become a stop so when the fire starts ahead if they come towards you you will eliminate them so we three deployed and we were waiting there and you know half an hour 40 minutes one hour so i asked uda yaar kya ho gaya they bloody crossed us bloody half an hour back they should have hit you in 5 minutes he said sir we are waiting nobody has come so i said you use your gadgetry find out so he used the gadgetry and he found out that they came towards him 
and they took a turn and went back into the other country through the minefield. And behind him, there was a huge party. All, all so everyone waited the whole night. Then next day, when I linked up with him, I asked him, "What the hell happened?" So he said, "Yes, sir. What had happened was a huge bear came and sat amongst us in the night. When you told me that they are coming towards you, just five minutes after that, this guy came and sat. Huge bear." and we didn't know what to do because you couldn't show him away we tried to show him away because the fire fight will start and uh, this guy was a friendly bear you know he put his hand on the other soldier and he was he was not trying to harm him also but this guy was trying to so that little bit of noise these militants would have heard so they must have known that there is a deployment ahead so they did not go back the route they took because if they were taken a route back we would have shot them so he they turned and they went back into the other country you know so next day we we, we realized so but what i'm saying is even then we had all the latest weaponry where uh, the gadgetry where we knew and today the systems have become much more better today we have drones immediately something happens a drone is launched every guy is carrying a drone so even infrared drone so in the night also you can see so even they are carrying you know you know latest gadgetry latest weapon thing so this this game will carry on there is no doubt both sides will keep improving today the robots have come you know the robots have come the robo not only the robo soldiers have come the robo dogs have also come that is instead of carrying a, you know a, a dog with you you can carry a robo dog also he will run as fast as a horse so the warfare is going to you know uh, and with the size of drones becoming lesser and smaller and smaller uh, weapons are being carried by these drones and uh, all types of surveillance cameras are being carried he, he can drop anything on you you know so the battlefield is going to change tremendously in the coming years yes and communication has also improved because i believe in your time there used to be open radio communication so aap 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 terrorist ki bhi aap baatein sun sakte the some yeah. that was there during that time so yeah, the yeah, lab valley and all those places yeah, yeah yeah see today you can't intercept their communication or or maybe you can intercept partly but earlier you used to uh, you know intercept anything and everything anything and everything and i'm sure they would have been also intercepting us though though our uh, but today there is encrypt- encryption also and so uh, only a country will be able to you know uh, intercept our communication but a local terrorist and a militant will not be able to you know intercept our communication but we will be able to but they are using satellite phones these days so you are not able so you feel that no radio set is opening but uh, they are using telephone uh, satellite uh, you know telephones so so yes uh, communication earlier we used to get a lot so but today you are getting footprints of this uh, you are getting footprints so if any movement is taking place if some movement has taken place somewhere see the sensors have come sensors which we are using are uh, they are you know uh, heat seeking sensors so if any movement intrusion has taken place the intrusion detection system in the you know these uh, 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 barriers which we have which we have erected on the borders they give them away the only problem is then in certain areas due to the terrain these uh, you know these fences are not uh, you know effective but in most of the places the, the you see punjab why terrorism over there has stopped one is because of the action which the police and the army took but the second is that you have put a very effective fence in punjab so uh, you cannot uh, come across here yeah, you can dig some tunnels and two or three guys can come but earlier the the way they used to infiltrate that infiltration is stopped and of course the public also of punjab didn't did not support uh, terrorism so so it died its natural death here also kashmiris do not support it's just 2 3% of kashmiris who are supporting and that also would have stopped now because they have seen the writing on the wall uh, pakistan is a you know failed state so who are you looking for they will not be able to give you anything other than some emotions here and there and all that also for their own reason 
so so i feel that you know uh, the, these fences are the ones which and with the help of sensors th this type of infiltration has stopped so the infiltration will be in you know in just in very small numbers in, in these days so they will have to come through the other route that is with proper passports and things like that and that also what is happening is radicalization is taking place that is your subverting the mind through social media this is a very big weapon and lone wolf attacks are taking place that is you are you are trying to radicalize a huge segment of population through the social media and someone who is uh, depressed for whatever reasons he catches on this information and he feels yes i think operation is taking place i think the system has gone to dogs i think i need to take some action so that radicalization that net which is being thrown for everybody that guy falls a trap to it so this is the new war radicalization subversion of minds so one has to be very positive you can't go against a system they are there for you you have to be with the system right sir sir uh, we hear a lot about uh, lolab valley during your times when terrorism was at its peak why is that area so notorious yeah see shamshabari ridge is there the ridge line is there and uh, jungles are very thick and uh, the neighboring villages are there and uh, you know the north of peer punjal the uh, the fence is not as effective as south of peer punjal south of peer punjal the fence is very effective there is no way you can get across it north of peer punjal the the snowfall is very heavy and if the snowfall is very heavy the fences are damaged and once the fences are damaged then there are large number of areas where you can infiltrate and lolab valley is uh, uh, you know the jungles of lolab valley because there are these are areas from which infiltration is very easy you come from that area so so it uh, it is the same as uh, uh, the terrain does not favor anybody terrain is neutral and uh, you do not have so many troops that you can you know uh, Uh, you can hold ground you can only seek contact and again the same problem comes when you seek contact you are moving and the other party is waiting because they have to they move by day they don't move by night we move by night if you move by day the civilians are watching you everybody is watching you see the what happens is uh, Uh, Aditya, the the in the hinterland and these areas like Lola, Kishwar, all these areas, maintenance of a tactical surprise is very difficult during that day. So the scare of the gun, terror. Now, if I am staying, I am a civilian. I have my wife, I have my daughter, I have my children who are staying with me. I am in the hinterland, and if the web uh, terrorist comes at night and tells me, look here. if the army passes from here and you dare not tell me i will kill all of you that is enough i will go running and i will tell there is some movement taking place if i don't do that my whole family is killed they butchered so what happens is in the daytime you the armed forces cannot carry out any movement we have to move by night and at night he does not move he is very clear he moves only by day and what he does is he puts 10 civilians ahead 15 civilians here 20 civilians ahead he asks by phone by whatever means has any movement taken place in your area so that is the way he moves and we are moving by night so lolab is an area where in at night when you are moving and he is static the chances of contact are very high but the jungles are very thick so it favors us also but terrain being terrain is neutral and will favor the defender that is the person who is not moving yes sir sir so uh, like if we talk about the militancy there uh, in in lolab valley and the, during the times that you were the early 90s of in in kashmir uh, so we have you talked about the differences that were there du during the militancy of then and then the militancy of now so do you think is there is a need to like change anything tactically do you believe 
anything that needs to be changed uh, you know actually what i will say is that we have to educate our masses and that is one we have to win the psychological battle which is very clear we need the public and the population on our side education is very important and uh, you know uh, i remember you know uh, general leader was there in uh, you know in rajori he was there and uh, he was south of pir panjal he commanded a brigade also and then subsequently he commanded a division also we have a couple of other officers also of ours now they are senior officers so what happens is uh, these uh, leaders you know senior officers senior generals they understand the picture very well where does terrorism take place you if you see uh, read you know the earlier books of uh, you know uh, uh, the future shock you know alvin toffler uh, he uh, he said where wherever growth takes place so growth will not take place all over the country wherever growth is not taking place a void will come and terrorism insurgency left wing extremism will come so you see the corridor of lwe left wing extremism wherever growth has not taken place that is where the corridor will come right from nepal down to telangana and downwards it has come so the country the system has to bring growth in these areas so i remember you know general leader you know what he did at that those times was we told him that sir when he became he was our commanding officer in sri lanka after general tej patak he became co9 para sf so when he became a general so we told him that sir these are the areas you know hilkaka surun kot baflia so many areas sir militants are here as many you kill they keep coming from across so what he did he made a plan and he made a black tarmac route right up to hilkaka he convinced the people on top that sir let's make a road so they flew you know bulldozers by hectares they took it across on top from there they made roads black tarmac roads right up to the mountains on top so wherever we told the militants are there they made roads over there so what happened is buses started flying on those roads and things like that and uh, wherever then roads and infrastructure comes up the militants run from those areas because development has come and because the roads have come the armed forces also land up over there so what i am trying to say is that if we bring development in all these pockets where there is terrorism and insurgency basically growth where it has not taken place insurgency and terrorism takes place so the country and the system is trying its best because money is not there it's how much money is there with us that much and no more so we need to distribute our wealth in a manner where the money is not spent the funds are not spent just on the mainstream it has to come to all these pockets where insurgency terrorism lefting extremism is taking place and we have to tell the public that we are with you and we also understand that it is not because of anything that you are with them it is terror the terrorist is very clear that par flows out of his barrel he is very clear he kills one in front of everybody and he has terrorized that whole village that's what they do subjugation and terrorism is basically through the barrel of the gun if we bring infrastructure development and if we educate our masses our youth our children terrorism is gone so then you know then it is just your own country and your constitution of course these problems will continue we have to take it with us is today you see uh, people from northeast nagaland from kashmir they are spread all over the country of ours today they have accepted us their children are studying with us we don't harm them we have never harmed them we never had a Ill, Ill intention we knew it was a proxy war whether it was china or it was this side pakistan whatever it is but we were very clear and they are also doing their business what is the enemy is supposed to do enemy will fight us that's what the enemy is there for so he is doing their they are doing their thing we have to do our thing and we have to understand the complete perspective so what you are saying is absolutely right if we 
the the systems are changing the dynamics is changing we need to bring the masses with us and for that development has to be brought for that more and more money has to be pumped in employment has to be brought in those areas opportunities have to be given to those children they have to be brought this side and shown that this is what give them free quotas let them come this side and study give them scholarships as much as possible so instead of taking up a gun they will come and study right education becomes very important very important absolutely give, give them quotas let them join the armed forces let them join the police let them join government services instead of them joining the militancy or the terrorism you give them a opportunity from 18 years onwards he should be given a assured job right yeah sir how was your experience of kargil war and oh, you know actually and that was time, s yeah. Yeah, we, yeah i was in staff so i had okay. just come back from united nations and uh, i was a brigade major of a, you know of a brigade which was a reserve brigade uh, which was you know given its own task so i could not join the battalion at that time so our whole brigade had moved up to you know a, a particular location and we were deployed uh, for an offensive so i could not leave the brigade so it is uh, just one of those things where you know i couldn't join uh, nine para sf <laughs> it's a, must have uh, wanted to join yeah mm. of course uh, yeah. That, you know it's a unit where uh, you know i had just left them and so when i came back after un uh, you know so i came back in 99 uh, 99 april and uh, this took place in july so in those 2 3 months you know i was posted in staff and uh, and this where i was posted that brigade moved out so that commander said there is no way you will go anywhere you are the brigade major brigade major is the right hand man of the commander so he does all the planning and all that and uh, as i have i was an operations chap so you know gentleman that yeah, brigadier siddu he said there is no way over my dead body you will go nowhere so it was just one of those things and we didn't expect uh, this was a very short war just for two months yeah so before you can say anything the war was over you know so and it was not it, it came suddenly and uh, the the gravity of it no one knew so we knew that because of which a war can take place but we did not expect uh, uh, you know now you know the whole thing that it was a foolishness on the part of uh, you know uh, the then that uh, general musharraf it was his basically plan to come and hold heights thinking that you know you you will cut off siachen where is siachen you know and uh, that is how you, you now our country has made another route so even if this then other side is open all 12 months so it has done us good that we have got uh, you know another and uh, they did not expect us to react that is foolishness how can you expect a country as strong as india not to react and they were they were they were armed army people of theirs pak army armed people uh, not terrorists who were in civil dress sitting over there trying to pose as if they were you know terrorists fighting for kashmir so, so it, they were living in a fool's paradise and they didn't expect our country our government to fight them they thought that you know we will just let it be the reaction and the violent reaction of india they couldn't take so this one of those things they were not prepared i think for it not for the reaction they that they not, were going to do they did not expect us to react so violently see for us yeah. our motherland is very dear uh, the our country has never attacked anybody over the years we have not attacked and uh, so we are very contented content with ourselves we are very happy you know spiritually we are very strong so uh, we, we there is no question of us going anywhere so when they come uh, you know and hold our ground when they come and hold our area our ground you have seen the way those battalions reacted with such fierceness whether it is the artillery or it is the infantry or it is the paratroopers or the special forces every one gave their blood and sweat and reclaimed everything back so uh, so that that has taught them a lesson 
that you don't take us lightly. Yeah, we are quiet and nothing, and you know they make fun of us. That uh, you know, but uh, but when it comes to our motherland, then uh, not only the armed forces, whether it is the state police, whether it is the CRP, or whether it is our citizens, everyone stands up in unity. So, I think it's a good lesson for everybody. Right. Uh, sir would you like to tell us something about major sudhir walia sir yeah sudhir uh, very sweet very very sweet very motivated person i remember sudhir you know uh, uh, he was in sri lanka uh, of fort jat you know so we saw him uh, general leader at that time he was a ceo uh, colonel leader then he saw sudhir in sri lanka so and we knew that uh, and we wanted officer you know uh, sf unit works with uh, you know volunteer force uh, you know either physically or in battle you know something happens and our you know wastage wastage rate is very high so you are just lucky a person like i who can survive right through from a lieutenant onwards till the ceo and then i have come out but still it does take its toll so we want large number of volunteers and we keep looking out for good officers to join us so colonel uh, leader you know general leader then colonel leader saw sudhir walia in sri lanka so he said what i'll do i need some officers so we will carry out some cross training so we did some cross training and we trained a, a number of infantry you know the quick reaction teams of theirs and sudhir came to us in sri lanka in one of these qrt training he, and we told him that we want you so he said sir my ceo there is no way he is going to allow me to join which happens all infantry unit they don't allow their good officers to come or whoever whatever officer they don't allow so general uh, leader at that time colonel leader said okay i will work it out so gradually we made a this thing to him and so he came to us uh, subsequently once we had deinducted from sri lanka then he came to us uh, Sudhir is a wonderful officer, very very motivated from Himachal. Uh, he was not only a good soldier; he was also a very good, uh, you know, human being. And he was also doing very well in courses, outstanding in courses. All courses he was alpha. And he uh, he was very humble also, very daring, very courageous, and uh, the troops loved him. You know, uh, he used to be a very caring, uh, you know, officer. he loved his troops and he looked after them and he you know uh, he was a true leader you can say so it is just uh, you know very sad for us that immediately after kargil you know and he was the adc to the you know to general malik who was the chief of army staff and he made a request and somehow even though the chief of army staff for you know in those times was very busy and he couldn't have spared but he let him go he said okay you go uh so he went and joined the battalion and uh, he fought the kargil war and after that he uh, from there directly nine para got into you know uh, kashmir situation and in one of those you know operations he got stuck in a you know hideout and uh, and that hideout also was located in a you know it was like a cliff assault where he single handedly had to you know with just a few of them he made an assault so the the decision making is such where uh, you cannot fall back like i told you every person on ground is a leader so he was at a stage where if he had stepped back those militants who were caught up in a cave would have gone so this is the decision where he said i will open fire and i will charge at these militants and uh, he told his party which was a little away you come and link up with me so the fierce uh, fire fight he had with them he was hit and he was though he evacuated but he you know the, the, he took a very bad hit so it is just one of those things so we feel very sad not only him you know we lost such good officers so yeah sir how is the mood in the battalion when uh someone is martyred how does the battalion cope with that yeah the battalion uh, we are a very uh, you know you 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 i am sitting in front of you so when you know so i i i will try and describe myself so that's what generally the mood of the battalion is when you 
when you take a hit you you have to be cool and calm there is no way you can get emotional if you get emotional that is what the enemy wants you then he will come and hit you every time then he knows that these guys they will take it emotionally you have to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait so if you have to carry out an action you have to carry out reconnaissance 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 you have to create models so we are people who so if something like this happens yes we know we have made a mistake somewhere we we do our study we we write down whatever has happened how it has happened we break down the whole thing we understand we take our lessons learned and we carry it home we ensure that so we thread bear we talk to each and every soldier a commando on that day on that night how it had happened we reconfigure the whole thing and we understand where something went wrong and we ensure we try and ensure that what we have studied and what knowledge we have gained we pass it on to our other soldiers and other officers everybody it is passed on nothing in writing all verbally it is told and you understand each other very well so that we don't make but we don't get emotional you cannot get emotional if you get emotional is only on the ground to get your guy back and out of the danger zone otherwise and there also you are cold and calm you know if you are going to get hit so be it you are cold and calm there is no way you can act in a emotional and in a immature way no way no way that is stupidity that is immaturity so when something and let me tell you the same is with all fighting arms there is no immaturity anywhere and not only this let me tell you after seeing so much of the state police armed police crpf they all are very mature warfare and proxy war and terrorist fighting terrorist fighting militancy terrorism lwe wherever you are you have to be cool and calm see what the other guy is doing that is his perspective you can't take it personally and we also cannot take it personally some days we are hit some days he is hit he also doesn't get emotional you also cannot get emotional there is a lot of it's a chess game it's a chess game where you have to be cool and calm and if you hold then your senior officers also hold everybody holds with you you give the correct advice and correct inputs to senior officers to take the correct decision so to work as a well oiled machine you have to be cool and calm in whether in battle or in peace time that is what soldiering is all about it's all about discipline right so any stories that you remember about him about, about sudhir walia sir yes sudhir <laughs> yeah sudhir uh, sudhir used to you know joke around a lot and you know he used to uh, there was a little you know uh, uh, is generally as sf officers you are always deployed far and away from each other you know so uh, we generally whenever we go out for operations we go out together but otherwise in informal locations we hardly are there we are never there in the peace time like i told you there are no parties there is no you don't even wear a uniform you are forever in operations so informally i uh, maybe you know in you know where you are meeting the troops and having a drink with them so maybe once or twice uh, i remember he used to sing very well and he used to crack jokes a lot and he used to dance with the troops a lot he was a person with a lot of zing lot of zing so a person like i am cool and calm and i will sit quietly in one corner and whole party i will just be watching and smiling here and there he is a person who is on the floor singing dancing chatting up the men you know laughing joking you know so <laughs> he was a live wire yes sir sir so how was your tenure as the ceo of nine para isf i mean what were the challenges yeah. if there yeah. were any you know nine para isf is a very difficult battalion to command you know so yeah. 
This I realized only later. If I had known it earlier, I would not have asked to command nine pairs. <laughs> you know, because the reason is your your boss is also is a lieutenant general, is a three star general, and his boss, that is your RO, is also a lieutenant general. While all other you know commanding officers have a brigade commander and a, a major general, uh, you know, as a div commander. So you have so and there is a lot of distance. and uh, you know so uh, there is a lot of routine work and things like that and all that here you are under the scrutiny of two lieutenant generals so it's a very difficult command and he has the whole system with him he has the whole system you have nothing with you you are just commanding i don't want to mention the strength so you are just commanding that many troops yes what do we have we have terrain knowledge from a lieutenant onwards i have walked the length and breadth of the operational area so that is my knowledge and hundreds and hundreds of you know small battles here and there we have fought so that is our knowledge and the troops are very disciplined and we know each other very well and all of that but that is it but the situation on ground keeps changing constantly so when you are working under the eyes and ears of very senior officers it becomes very difficult for a commanding officer of a special forces unit so that is how we had given a feedback that more special forces units have to be raised at that time we had only three special forces units so now we have a large number of special forces units so we had said sir we can't carry this burden day in and do day out you know you are putting so much of pressure on our men and on us to perform so we we are we also have our families it is very difficult we have children so constantly being in battle so someone so we are trained and we the passion is in us but not in our families not in our children they want you to also take a break and they are in constant fear that every day you are out whether you will come back or not why you are undergoing this test of fire what is it so we had given a feedback at that time that more and more special forces units have to be raised there is no dearth of you know manpower there no dearth of volunteers and uh, when it is a requirement then you raise you raise as many battalions as possible so yes it is a challenge i enjoyed each and every day of my command and i knew anything and everything whatever will happen i will be able to face this challenge no there is but there was not a single day when you felt that you are at peace no way the situation is very challenging every day uh, just to give you an example you know uh, i remember uh it was uh, january 25th jan i'm just giving you one incident you know just uh, maybe i'll give you one or two more but uh, just it was you know i had sent a small you know about two men with some uh, you know weapons to be deposited at jabalpur so there was a party which was carrying damaged weapons to be taken to jabalpur and uh, uh so they were to catch the night train and uh, jammu is just uh, you know 50 odd kilometers from where we were located so these two guys went and some vehicle dropped them and the vehicle came back and those two out of the two one was you know at the parcel office in jammu railway station and the other guy had gone to have his food and the train was in the night whatever and so when this happened uh, what happened was suddenly firing took place in jammu railway station and uh, so the guy who went to have food he was there itself and this guy and they were both in civil dress because they were they were carrying you know weapon parts to be de- de- deposited so this guy didn't want to leave his that small box which was kept in front of the parcel office so what he did is this guy he hid in between the boxes so firing it's a normal thing firing is taking place so the first thing is you hit the ground and you take cover and like a good soldier he was watching what was happening and suddenly he saw one you know militant from across the rail the platform on the other platform he was firing 
and then he cr jumped he crossed the tracks and he came and hid took lying position next to him this militant so and he continued firing he thought this guy is dead because he was firing on all the civilians all around but as soon as that guy came and lied down on on next to him this my guy who was in civil dress he jumped on him and they both fought and fought and fought and this guy you know he held the barrel of that uh, militant and uh, that's this militant he tried his best he kicked him he did this he took out you know gren uh, grenades with his other arm and he burst them he said i'll kill you also i'll also die so and uh, from the parcel office all the civilians were watching but nobody had the you know this thing to come outside and you know try and help this guy because that guy was they were still fighting and they didn't know what to do and somehow this guy managed to you know snatch the weapon from the militant and kill him and uh, after that he was he was because his fingers were blown off because he was holding the barrel and in that barrel is a, there's a lot of heat in the barrel so the 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 fingers of his you know hand slipped and it went on top where he was firing so his fingers were blown off and those grenades this guy was throwing on himself so he was also injured and the militant also but the militant probably died by one of the splinters must have hit him in the wrong place whatever so so the civilians took my guy nine para guy and they rushed him to the hospital i was aware that uh, you know uh, uh, incident had taken place we were stand by and we were ready to move to jammu you know uh, railway station when i was told ke sir your guy has killed one militant i said how can my guy kill a militant he was in civil dress and he was going out and you know that is a, another div division area and things like that so anyhow we we we, we, we that is how. so i am just giving you one incident another incident i remember you know there are so many of them but another incident i'll tell you we were going to you know another area or an operation and uh, uh, you know at that time i think the team commander was uh, general uh, now general uh, ajay dabas so he was the team commander and we were going for an operation somewhere else with his team when uh, you know one of the core commanders who was the colonel of the regiment you know uh, general nirbhay so he called me sanjay where are you i said sir i am a little away from you he said there is a in a telephone exchange next to my headquarter some militants have got into it so can you come and help i said sir yeah i can surely come and help so when we went over there we saw rr battalion was already deployed over there so so i told the, how can i carry out this operation unless you and you are firing at this building with a 32 room exchange i said how can i enter and kill those militants you have to make way and you have to stop firing so they didn't stop firing they kept whatever you know this is what generally happens you know when there are and there were they, i saw the police officers were also there and all that so i was very clear that sir i will not enter this place unless the situation is handed over to me so general nirbhay sharma who was a colonel of the regiment also then he intervened and he so in the meantime by the time the situation was handed over to us 13 14 casualties the rr had already suffered so when it was handed over to me it was i think the next day around 10 am or something by then one officer had died and there were 12 13 serious uh, casualties so anyway so we were given this situation and uh, we put you know snipers all around and whatever we you know and in this time when all the firing was taking place we were not sitting quiet we were running around the building all around and we were seeing what was happening and all that but and we saw what is where uh, in case we are in, we were very sure the situation will given to us so we did not waste time so the whole night we were jumping around from building to building to building to building and checking out the locations of these guys and from where they can run and what so next day when the situation was handed over before that we are, our snipers were deployed everybody was deployed and we made a assault a one nudge somewhere nudge somewhere and an assault so it was fake nudges and an assault and uh, only one i remember one uh, naib subhadar devraj 
uh, he he got a you know muscle injury the bullet shot and we killed the militants within not even an hour and uh, we handed over the body to the uh, rr battalion we said you know if wish you had handed out for the situation to us yesterday itself you know why you know waste when you know you have a good team waiting better to hand over you know anyway it is just one of those things so uh, you know so 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 the uh, a ceo of a, a special forces unit is constantly you know his his he, you have to keep reacting and but the system is with you uh, the all gadgetry all officers all experts are ready to brief you and help you in every they know that you have years and years of experience you know the terrain very well and you are the best for that low level you know sub unit level operations sir to uh, is there or is there any situation where you have to push back uh, to the leadership as well so for example if the le- leadership is trying to hurry up the process in an operation and you want no, have to say here, like no we are not going in right now yeah here general nirbhay you know very fine officer very very fine officer so general nirbhay you know he shouted at me and he said ki yeah what the hell why are you bloody delaying what and you know when three star is shouting at you so you see how we keep our cool is that lives are dependent on you. he is doing his job we are doing our job whoever is the senior officer he is they are doing their jobs so he says that i can't this is a very small there just uh, i don't know how many militants are inside but uh, he, they are holding hostages also the more you delay the more difficult it becomes so why don't you so i, I told him that i can't i can't enter like this i will not enter i want the situation so he fired up here left right all that and he you know try to uh, find out what the hell is happening so in a in a battlefield it is chaotic because you are not there in the situation you are you know located somewhere else that is the senior officer and in between something and there is fire fight going on and the the junior leadership is involved so junior leadership is into it you have to understand so and they would have lost their colleagues they would have lost something it gets slightly emotional at such situations and i was very clear that in with all these types of you know firing going on i will lose my men where men comes then all junior leaders whether it is me or anybody we take a stand there is no way sir no way you sack me you throw me out uh, i remember one more incident you know uh, we were somewhere in high altitude siachen area and uh, we had to carry out something you know and uh, the senior officer told me that you know uh tomorrow we are going so i am very senior officer so i told him that sir we have not carried out an exercise we have not uh, you know exercise together such a large body he said you are going to lead i said yes i will lead of course i will lead but uh, we have not carried out we don't know each other uh, there are so many you know infantry and all that uh, they are going and uh, i am going to lead i don't know anybody will follow me i might only with my nine para party will go across and then what so he said what are you scared i said i am not scared he said if you are scared you sit out said okay so i said sir please you think after so many years i am going to be scared i am saying that we need to exercise together i want at least two nights or three nights in similar this is what army is all about that guy he got very angry with me and all that but he was doing his job because he was under pressure from other parties and i was very clear that i am not going to move an inch i will and i am not going to step aside also it is a it is a unit ka izzat that you have been called to carry out an operation and to be in the lead and i said i, I, I will lead but i want to train for at least one night if not two in similar conditions so he said that will delay the whole thing i said let it get delayed sir you should have thought about this i am not going i want it so we haggled and haggled so <laughs> he was aghast that a bloody young officer is <laughs> 
taking a such a stand i said sir my it's my men they will suffer casualties this is not the way and if you if we train just one night before going in nothing will happen and even now if you order me we will go without anything but the better thing is you give me one night so he was also very mature he said okay give me let me time he, they took a tea break and all that and then he said okay i'm giving you one night tonight tomorrow we go in and tonight you carry out so we went into a similar terrain we went back 20 30 km we did our training and all and we came back to the same location and in the meantime the government said no so whatever it is all the other officers came and congratulated me sir aapne bacha liya <laughs> it would have been a fiasco agar hum bina training ke hum andar jaate so as a commanding officer of a of a unit of a unit like nine para and not only you know you are taking and you are not thinking you know ahead ki maine lieutenant general banna hai mujhe ye karna nothing we never were bothered uh, whatever it is we are ready to go out in the same rank that is why you don't see very many special forces officers in the senior rank because hum har har roz kisi ke na kisi ke sath lad lete <laughs> we don't want we want the uh, we want the lives of our men and we want to carry out a professional job and we want to carry out some training uh, you know so thoda sa you you seen all these good players if if they if you upset them in some way he will say i am not playing tomorrow like you see virat kohli he has not played in this last series he is such mm-hmm. a good player he didn't play because there was some personal issue so he similarly we are the best on the ground so if something doesn't favor us or something we do put our foot down and we don't think that you know in the next series i may not get selected or something like that no we are very clear that we are the best and but we want a little bit of due also and little bit of training and all that and we, a level playing field to be given to us and not to be just taken for granted so we do and it is for the men in nothing no personal there is no ego there is nothing like that it's for the men and if you are not going to make it to the next rank so be it and that is why most of the sf officers go home as colonels we don't want <laughs> our men are more important <laughs> yes so you just draw a line that we are not expendable we are good at what we do but we are not expendable yeah you're right you're right yes sir you mentioned in one uh, in one of your podcast also that uh, agar general banna hai then don't come to sf uh, that is not the place for you yeah you are absolutely right you know see we, the other day i was telling you know we a unit like ours uh, which has such excellent visionaries they don't go beyond a colonel maximum you go up to a brigadier we have had uh, general tej patel from nine para and uh, general uh, you know uh, uh, leader uh, from nine para two commanding officers of nine para and only two commanding officers from nine para have risen up to the three star yes we had some officers who came and served with us and became three stars but they served with us and like uh, general paramjit singh sanga he was from nine para he went and commanded four para and he became a three star general but we claim only two officers that is uh, they were ex co rest all are brigadiers and below they have gone home but they were the best soldiers so which means that when you put your foot down then you are you are hurting people but we feel that it is better to hurt your senior officers than to lose lives so yeah. and as a you know as a commanding officer you are emotionally attached to your men i have fought with my senior officers so much that they at that time also they shudder bhai thakur aa raha hai that's a stupid guy <laughs> i used to fight for my men i always fought for my men not for anything else it is for their lives they have families they have children you know so and i'm sure anybody else in our position will also fight it's not something but and we are very proud of the unit we serve in we are very proud with the men and the men know that we will fight men will all the men know that he is not going to become a three star general and sell us off no way 
whether in peace or in war, we will stand by them. Even today, if anybody gives me a call, he knows that we are going to reply. We are going to help him out in whatever way possible. Right. So the the stand that you took uh, during uh, when when you mentioned that hockey ka match ho raha tha and you took a stand for you know, the good players. So that philosophy in life for you continued in armed forces as well. <laughs> yes, you are right. <laughs> so nice of you, Aditya. Yeah, yeah you are right. <laughs> yes, sir. Sir, so uh, when uh, Major Vivek Jacobs sir came in for probation, you were the CEO, or it was no, uh, I was I think the two ICE or something, a very fine officer, very fine officer. He was a live wire, excellent officer, excellent, and uh, same. his thing was i remember you know we were in the unit in udampur and uh, suddenly i say yaar vivek kahan gaya vivek sir wo canteen mein lad raha hai i said yaar what has, what has happened sir somebody he was with one of our guys and somebody told that uh, you know commando who was with him something and usne collar pakad liya usko i said yaar bhago usko pakdo wo maar dega sabko maar dega that guy is a live wire he uh, uh, you know he thinks from his heart and he acts from his heart you know when you use your head too much then uh, you can make some mistakes here and there because then survival comes and so many other things come when you are you know thinking from your heart acting from your heart and uh, you are clean and you are honest and you are genuine then the whole all the people all around you know that here the guy who will stand by you. and if you can't stand by him in peace then where will you stand by him in war when bullets are fighting so he was a life warrior as a young officer who just come for probation <laughs> <I remember. laughs> right sir why did you uh, take retirement no i didn't take retirement i super and okay. yeah okay 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 33 years and uh, some months and uh, my age was there and so i i retired i retired and yes. uh, but the ministry of defense or you know whatever they were very kind they gave me a job uh, when i retired i went to jsw steel salem as their vice president that was a huge uh, plant uh, integrated steel factory uh, next to coimbatore uh, about 10000 employees you know and every day there were strikes over there every day so they the the army people and the jsw staff they were very clear they wanted somebody who can handle this issue and they said such a good plant where the steel 99.99% steel which is being produced for the automobile industry is uh, they are not able to function so i landed up over there and i i must have fought with everybody over there <laughs> so but in just one one and a half years all the people who are fighting with me they all became my friends uh, even today they are my friends uh, you know so i served over there for about 4 years and uh, put systems in place and connected everybody with everybody and that plant is functioning excellent even today and uh, so many hassles of the local public over there and you know whatever and everybody had problems and uh, it was basically communication gap you know the owners were sitting in mumbai and there was a management over there and the management was being you know threatened and blackmailed and assaulted and so many things over there but when they found a guy like me who was there at the gates as soon as a moment you know something takes place i used to be there so the, then the local public also they said no you are come from the so you tell the people on top that we want some development here we want a bus stop here we want this road over here you are making in crores you are giving us nothing so this message up and down was passed and basically it turned out it was a communication problem that's it so when once that was resolved then uh, you know things uh, fell into place so so that's it i enjoyed my four years of working in a factory you know, really mm-hmm. enjoyed <laughs> so do you miss army life uh see <laughs> army is in my blood <laughs> yeah so of course uh, you know uh, every day and i remember each and every day of my life in the army, each and every day so i do miss uh, but uh, but a person like uh, you know so many of us who are there we can't sit idle so i worked there for about 4 years and then after that uh, you know i had thought of there is one certification aditya i want everybody through you to know american society for industrial security 
it is it is aces it's one of the oldest uh, international security organizations in the world so their certifications to pass is very difficult uh, very difficult and their manuals are written in such a supremely technical way uh, which is all about security they have seven subjects uh, on security so 360 degree security they are the ones who have written and all sops everything and if you pass their certification you will walk into a job anywhere in the world you open asis today in google and you will see what i am talking so i had thought to myself long back that when i find the time i will pass this certification so i saw that you know even after retiring you know four years i worked over there there was no time i had bought my my brother had presented me these books were very expensive Two two and a half lakh rupees. This set technical set of these manuals. So he came. He settled in US. So he presented me this set. He said, Sanjay, I want you to pass this exam. So I studied one year. You know, more than a year. Uh, October twenty two, I started studying, and uh, August twenty three, also I passed this examination. It is CPP, Certified Protection Professional. So world over, people recognize you as a professional. Now what happens is. you know and my friends know that i am a special forces person I, i any situation i can handle on ground whether i am armed or unarmed but in a corporate world or where factories are there industries are there you know uh, residential areas are there commercial hubs are there all the hospitals hotels all these places uh, there is a technicality which is involved so you have to pass such a you know certification then the market also understands that you understand and you have connected the dots so so i passed this examination as soon as i passed this examination uh, i had a dream 20 years back you know uh, that i want to open my own small uh, company so when i passed this examination so having been in sf then having been in for about 4 years in a factory and seen the corporate world and the factory life and the nitty gritty and dynamics involved i said i will pass this examination uh, open a company after i have passed this examination so at uh, 60 years you know uh, of age i when i wrote this examination the children around me were about 25 years of age so they told me uncle aap padhai kar rahe ho i said yaar bachche kuch to karna hai <laughs> so but they were shocked i was the only guy who passed the examination so after passing that examination i have opened a private security agency and uh, the aim is the same the passion is the same to give safety and security now instead of uh, you know in the army i am giving you know safety and security and investigations to the public so it is a passion which we we know backwards so whichever factory i go to whichever hotel i go to hospital i go to they are very ready to give me their security contract or any corporate investigations to conduct and they know that it you know that he, they will he will do a you know professional job so that's what i'm i have one child one daughter she is in amsterdam so she is very happy and she says that i will come after i have you know uh, I, she also after 2 3 years of whatever she is working and she is a psychologist so so i said okay then i have to pass my time while my time till then <laughs> that's how <Right>. it is <laughs> so you, the name of your organization is force 9 right yeah Just i want to context for <laughs> viewers yeah yeah i want to nine to be part of it <laughs> yes sir absolutely and nine being added to force it becomes a very uh, yeah thank you uh, force is what actually. we are calling the universal force you know so yeah. if you recollect uh, our prime minister modi also has said so many times let the force be with you force be with you force yes. is the universal force and nine is uh, you know uh, we uh, durga durga mata is uh, uh, even nine para hamara jo hai wo durga mata hai do we we have all teams have different deities so but we pray to durga mata so i wanted and nine is a uh, this thing a rhythm a uh, number connected to durga mata so i wanted nine to be part so force nine is what i have kept right <laughs> sir any advice for youngsters who want to join indian army or sf yeah yeah, yeah 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 
you know youth uh, youth are the future you are the architects of uh, our nation and uh, as i mentioned in the whole world uh, they are watching india very closely our youth are the ones who are going to take us in leaps and bounds uh, to the super stardom which india is bound to be nobody can stop us any amount of uh, you know subversion radicalization whatever they want to break our country it is not possible uh, our destiny is with us and we are a very spiritual country we are very contented but we are very strong and uh, the the youth of our country the children of our country are the ones who are going to take us ahead and in such a complex world uh, the from the you know 21st century onwards the dynamism has started only the strong will survive and our children are very strong so what my advice to them is you have to be disciplined you have to be disciplined very disciplined very punctual and you have to accept everybody you keep religion aside don't mix religion with anything don't get emotional you must see the longer strategic game they want to break your country they want to tear it apart tear it apart they want to delay your superstardom so you have to see all of this and keep all these issues aside and back the teams back the system which is taking us ahead the youth have to decide today what to achieve and my second advice to the youth is and the children is that you have to achieve it in your mind it's a mind game everything is in your mind you have to win the battle inside your mind and as soon as you have won the battle in your mind you have won the battle in the universe it's as simple as that this is what that book of secret is you have to live your dream i had thought of my company 20 years back that i will open a company i will be its founder and i will be the ceo and the company has come and in between i said that even though i have done so much i am not fit outside in the market unless i have passed the international certification of aces i had won the battle long back in my mind that i will pass it so at 60 years of age i passed it every day for 10 to 12 hours for nearly a year i studied every day with complete focus i left my job i left everything i said i will pass the exam and in my first attempt itself i passed it and to pass the exam is not easy it is 85% marks you have to get and the objective type questions is very difficult there are four answers which are given all four are correct nearly correct so out of the correct the most correct is the one which is correct answer and it's an online examination and you have to pay 750 dollars to write that examination so which means the system wants you to fail so that you keep applying that is their way but if you pass that examination the future awaits you anywhere you can walk into a job of nearly a crore rupees you will be a country head a regional head you will look after not you will be a business partner of any business today security is not security security is you are being a business partner of that business because you have to get into each and every aspect every department to ensure there is no loss of revenue so loss prevention other than that cyber is there other than that physical security is there other than that you have to design various you know physical protection systems so my advice to our children our youth is you have to win it in your mind now to win the battle in your mind you should know what you want you cannot accept defeat there is nothing known as defeat so if you are failing study more you are failing study more and you keep your mind open because when one window closes 10 other doors open one door closes 10 other doors will open so you have to be awake and alert and conscious and meditate children you have to meditate i have been meditating from my young age onwards 83 82 83 onwards i have been meditating so you have to meditate uh, and the time to meditate is 4 to 5 in the morning please meditate and to meditate is very simple there are hundreds of techniques to meditate 
in meditation first you just learn to sit still that's the first battle second battle is you have to once you have learned to sit still and your spine erect you have to focus on your breathing see the breath when it comes in and see the breath when it comes out that is the second battle and the third battle is once you started seeing the breath see the gap in between the breaths so once you have started seeing the gap in between the breath that is when miracle takes place and then the fourth battle is your third eye starts opening up there are so many things which start you just start meditation stay focused keep good company around you because when you start meditating good company comes around you your 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 head is like an antenna it sends out vibrations you will attract the person which your mind is if your mind is positive if your mind is full of patriotism for the nation if your mind is a, a, an ideal mind what it should be you will attract law of attraction is like that you will get the best if you are positive you will attract positivity if you are negative you will attract negativity so be positive and not like that movie where anil kapoor says be positive and his wife says what the hell is it be positive is my blood group is be positive <laughs> <laughs> so our youth we you have to dream 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 and dream and the universe like sharukh khan says the pura kayanat ruka hua hai aapke liye aap sochiye what do you want and the whole kayanat will get after to ensure your dreams are realized you first decide what you want okay the secret also i will tell you children is that once you have thought of a goal of a vision you have to hold it in your head and not an iota of doubt you have to hold it for seven whole minutes that thought why do you meditate you meditate because you are going to shoot this missile up into the universe to shoot this missile up into the universe you have to sit still you have to focus you have to hold it in your third eye and then you have to shoot it and after you are shooting it without with full positivity with no iota of doubt then you stop thinking about it it's done that's it now you think ahead that okay i have passed my examination now i have become an officer now i have been posted to this place and now i am this and i am this and i am this and ahead there is nothing look no looking back so when the youth start then you will not get diverted with drugs and alcohol and bad company so aapke nazdeek hi nahi aayenge you will only think positive and good people will come nothing untoward will happen you will always be smiling it does not matter whether you are the president you are the prime minister you are whatever you are it just does not matter your life is just a journey for your soul to evolve that's it what you are how much of bank balance you have what type of a car you have who are your neighbors they all do not matter it is your life's journey which matters and the correct journey as per the fundamentals of life you have to follow and once you are following the fundamentals the path will be meteoric there is nothing physical it's all knowledge spiritual knowledge inside your soul which will come and you will have a place to sleep you will have one or two meals to eat and that's it and you will have health and happiness and you will forever be in joy that should be your goal so what happens is when you are with filled with this type of a thinking you will give back to the society you will pay back to the society and the society will look after you the system will look after you if you start cribbing and crying and you know negativity and why this why not that let's correct the system let's do this let's do that then you are dithering from your path 
all of us have one role to play someone plays positive someone plays negative you see in the electricity the those wires also there is one positive one negative one neutral so everyone has got a, a life journey a path a role everyone can't be a hero somebody will be a villain someone will be this character role someone that so everybody is given a script in life so you have to see which is the script which has been given to you and you play your part whatever is the part and play to the hilt be a team player be a good player follow the rules of that game right sir thank you sir thank you so much for your time and thank you that you took out time to speak to us uh, your journey has been one of inspiration and we are sure that people will learn a lot from this episode so thank you and so much for your time yeah i would like to also thank you you are such a wonderful person at such a young age you have achieved so much in life and you are an old soul uh, i i probably have mentioned earlier that it is a god gift i i am a certified hypnotherapist i i show people past lives so and i have seen so much of the universe by going journeying with these souls and going backwards i have seen where the souls rest between deaths i have seen where hell is where heaven is everything there are no secrets in this world and a person like you you are a very old soul you are a very wise soul there is so much you are going to give to the society and you have already started at such a young age the whole world is waiting for you i wish you all the very best i also thank your parents for you know giving such a lovely son to this universe you are going to grow and grow and grow and take the public with you they are with you they love you thank you so much sir thanks thank you so much it means a lot coming from you thank, thank you. you thank you take care best wishes thank you sir